Good afternoon, Chairman. Good afternoon, Commissioner Gary. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Good afternoon. Hey there. All right. I'm going to, uh, I have one minute. I got to run and grab a glass of water. <laughs> Stay hydrated. It's going to be warm this weekend. I know. Wonderfully warm. Summer, it's finally here. Yes, that's what we do in Chicago. We skip spring, whatever that is. <laughs> it's winter, summer, boom. Crazy people jumping in the lake. <laughs> Somebody recently asked me, uh, is that a bucket list item? And I was like, it is not. <laughs> but you're in Chicago, you have to do it. I was like, I don't. <laughs> or wait until September when water it's a little warm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So Maurice, this is my double day. I get to see you interviewing. I know, I know. Tonight. Looking forward to it. What a nice event. Did you get a chance to see the video? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Great. Yeah. Right. You previewed it. Wonderful. You did a wonderful job. Yeah. Really excited about that. Yeah. And it's uh, he's in the exhibit too. We were able to add him to our housing show. So awesome. it's uh, a nice addition. Very, very nice. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Um, Deanna, who do we, how many do we need to have a quorum again? We need five for quorum, Commissioner. Okay, thank you. All right, well, let's get this uh, meeting rolling. Um, I'd like to call the meeting to order and I'll do the roll call. Uh, as I call your name, if you could uh, indicate that you're present and you can see and hear uh, me. Um, Commissioner uh, Hughes. Present, I can see and hear you. Thank you. Commissioner Osmond. I can see and hear you. Commissioner Djokovic. Present, I can hear and see, uh, see and hear you. Uh, Commissioner Geary. Present, I can hear and see you. Okay, and I am uh, Commissioner Cox. Uh, here, I can hear you and see you. Fantastic. And I think we are missing uh, Commissioner Burns is not going to be present today. Commissioner Ponce hopefully will join us very soon as well as Commissioner Tolliver. Um, with that, okay. Uh, last year, Governor Pritzker signed Public Act 101 0640, making certain amendments to the Open Meetings Act so that we, along with other boards and commissions can continue to host virtual meetings during this COVID-19 public health emergency provided that certain conditions are met. One of those conditions is that I, as head of the commission on Chicago landmarks, determined that an in-person meeting of the commission on Chicago landmarks and its permit review committee are not practical or prudent. I wanna make sure that our virtual meeting, uh, virtual meeting meets all the conditions of the Open Meetings Act as amended. Therefore, I'm making a determination pursuant to section 7E2 of the Open Meetings Act that an in-person meeting of this commission in Chicago Landmarks and its firm review committee is not practical or prudent. Similarly, I'm also making the determination pursuant to section 7E5 uh, that because of the disaster as declared by the governor, it is unfeasible for at least one member of the commission in Chicago Landmarks or its chief administrative office, officer or its chief legal officer to be physically present at the meeting place for either meeting. Uh, pursuant to a resolution adopted by the Commission on Chicago Landmarks on June 4th, 2020, regarding the Chairman's emergency rulemaking powers, I issued emergency rules governing the conduct of remote public commission meetings and provisions for remote public participation, effective uh, January 19th, 2021. 
These rules were posted on the commission's website. In line with these emergency rules, today's regular commission meeting is a virtual meeting being simulcast to the general public via live streaming. Commission meetings have been held virtually since May of last year. Meetings are structured to minimize the chances for technical difficulties. Members of the general public have been encouraged to submit written statements in advance of the meeting, and these have been posted on the commission's website and are available for public view during the virtual meeting at www.chicago.gov slash CCL. Members of the public uh, desiring to speak at today's meetings were required to register before the meeting and verbal statements by the public for all agenda items will take place at the beginning of the meeting. Applicants and their representatives, as well as aldermen, were asked to contact staff if they desire to speak, and they'll be able to do so after the staff presentation on a specific project. Nine members of the general public signed up to speak as of the deadline of 12.45 p.m. on Tuesday, June 1st, and were provided instructions regarding how to do so. I'd like to call upon those people now. Please limit your comments to three minutes. Uh, begin by stating your name and the association you re represent. And if any, for the record. Um, two people have signed up to speak about agenda item number two, the landmark recommendation for the Monastery of the Holy Cross. And so let me start with Mr. Carl Klein. Uh, Mr. Klein, floor is yours. Good afternoon. Um, this is Carl Klein. Um, the Monastery of the Holy Cross, formerly known as the Immaculate Conception Church, is a significant early work of Herman J. Call, a renowned Midwestern ecclesial architect of the early 20th century. The church was designed for a national parish to serve the German-speaking residents of Bridgeport. It is rated orange in the Chicago Historic Resources Survey. Hermann J. Gall was born in Cologne, Germany, and immigrated to the United States around the turn of the 20th century. He apprenticed with Louis Sullivan. In 1902, Gall established an architectural firm under his own name. He designed a number of Catholic churches, schools, rectories, and convents in Chicago, the Chicagoland area, and other Midwestern states, which were built to serve German immigrants. The Monastery of the Holy Cross Church has the distinctive feature of its high steeple visible for miles, making it a local visual landmark in Bridgeport. Its steeple is thought to be the tallest structure remaining in a neighborhood that once boasted numerous church towers, steeples, and domes. It is representative of the architectural and cultural and social heritage of the city of Chicago. The church was built in an era when the non-English speaking population of Bridgeport and the city at large was burgeoning. At that time, much of the social life of the immigrant population centered around their churches, which were designated as national parishes rather than diocesan parishes. Thus, the monastery church is significant as the sole remaining Catholic church established as a German national parish in Bridgeport. The church's architectural and aesthetic significance and value are established by its high Gothic design elements, by being a premier example of, the, of a work of a noted architect, and by its stained glass windows from Innsbruck, Austria. It is an example of a church built as a national parish in an era and neighborhood marked by non-English speaking immigrant communities. Thus, it has sig significant historic and community interest or value as well. Its integrity is further marked by its preservation of original design and materials and evidence is a high quality of craftsmanship that renders features like its stained glass windows irreplaceable. The Monastery of the Holy Cross, a Roman Catholic Benedictine contemplative community who is the legal owner of the church have act attentively maintained the original features of the church and the monks, the monks have consented to landmark designation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Klein. Um, we have Mr. Max Chavez. Mr. Chavez, floor is yours. Can you hear me all right? We sure can. Wonderful. Chairman Wong and members of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks, my name is Max Chavez. I'm Director of Research and uh, Special Projects for Preservation Chicago. And I'm speaking to you today to express our enthusiastic support for the potential landmark designation of Bridgeport's Monastery of the Holy Cross, formerly Immaculate Conception Church at 3101 South Aberdeen. This wonderful Gothic Revival Church was erected between 1908 and 1909 and designed by German immigrant Hermann J. Gall, whose works throughout Chicago constitute some of the most impressive buildings in this city. Much of Gall's works were commissioned by Chicago's thriving German immigrant community and his Immaculate Conception Church was no different. 
After its completion, the church was a thriving religious and social hub for Bridgeport's German Roman Catholics. These immigrant congregations, commonly known as national parishes, were based around a community's ethnic identity and specific religious practices, and they offered new citizens a safe point of entry into American society. Today, Monastery of the Holy Cross is the only remaining German national parish church in Bridgeport, and as such, is a crucial testament to the history of Bridgeport's earliest immigrant communities. While the church has cultural resonance for its surrounding neighborhood, Gaul's accomplishments at the site cannot be overstated. The church's classic Gothic revival with echoes of the German homeland both Gaul and the parishioners left behind. Gaul, who hailed from the city of Cologne and found inspiration in his hometown's famed Gothic cathedral, executed his design with grand flourishes. The church is replete with soaring lancet windows, a towering steeple adorned with gargoyles and finials, handsome masonry, and ornate window tracery. The interiors are equally as majestic. The church boasts high vaulted ceilings and gleaming stained glass windows, several of which were produced by the Tyrolese Art Glass Company, a famed glass manufacturer from Austria. Gall was an accomplished architect here in Chicago, and his works are today notable landmarks in the city. These include St. Benedict Church on Irving Park Road, St. Philomena on West Cortland, and the beautiful Athenium Theater on North Southport. Many of Gall's buildings have been recognized both in Chicago by the Chicago Historic Resources Survey and outside of Chicago by the National Register of Historic Places. He's one of the most significant artists of his craft from his time and his work at the Monastery of the Holy Cross is some of the most stunning in his career. This church is very special, at once a phenomenal architectural achievement and a site of significance for both Bridgeport and the immigrants that helped build this neighborhood. On a recent visit, I was fortunate enough to enjoy a recitation of Gregorian chants as performed by the monastery's monks. While their voices were wonderfully amplified by Gaul's acoustical design and the setting sun streamed through the shimmering windows, it was not hard to imagine then that this very well could be a vision of heaven on earth. We extend our grateful thanks to the Department of Planning and Development for their help in bringing the Monastery of the Holy Cross before the commission for consideration as a Chicago landmark. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Chavez. Uh, now we'd like to hear from those people who signed up to speak uh, regarding agenda uh, item number three, the landmark recommendation for the Muddy Waters House. And the first person up is uh, Wendy Muhammad. Uh, floor is yours, Ms. Muhammad. Thank you, Chairman Wong. Can you hear me okay? We sure can. So yes, I'm Sajda Wendy Muhammad. I'm the proprietor of the Elijah Muhammad House Museum, also known as Sajda House. And I stand with fellow members of the newly formed Chicago Black House Museum Coalition and Ms. Chandra Cooper for the establishment of the Mojo Museum as a landmarked property in honor of her great grandfather, Mr. McKinley Morganfield, most famously known as Muddy Waters. The Mojo Museum is the original house of blues. The great Muddy Waters has been given the title King of Blues, King of the Blues. And if he is the King of the Blues, then one could say he's the King of the Rock and Roll also, since rock and roll is the offspring of the blues. Not only was he impactful as a music legend, but as a giant uh, who rose from the great migration and whose struggle mirrors that of so many black people who came up from the Jim Crow South in search of a better life and more opportunities. His pain and struggle fueled his musical creativity. He was a great humanitarian who expressed his love through his warm hospitality and open arms. He served as a door of opportunity to many fellow musicians and paved the way for many music legends around the world. To elevate you know, from a Mississippi sharecropper to a five-time Grammy Award winner and member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is a sacred hero's journey that we all can be motivated by. When I look deeply into his face, I see the struggle of our people. I connect with a familiar pain that serves as the backdrop of a story that is in need of liberation, a story that will heal and educate the visitors of the Mojo Museum. McKinley Morganfield, AKA Muddy Waters, the person was a spiritual landmark, that beacon of hope for many during the great migration. This is why, in my opinion, his former home at 4339 South Lake Park in Chicago should absolutely receive landmark designation as we uplift and lift his name and, and save his legacy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Muhammad. Uh, I'd like to hear from Mary Lou Seidel. Mary Lou. Okay. Um, Mr. Hang on just one second. 
We'll make sure. Mary this... Lou, you just have you are unmuted. You, you, you're you should be able to speak. Mary Lou, there, there might be some issue with your mic, but you are unmuted in Zoom. Zoom. Oh. Now, now we just heard a little bit from you. Good here. Very low volume. Mary Lou, if you could turn up your mic. Can you come back to me? I'm starting to hear you a little bit. Can you come back to me? Now it's a little better. I am not, I am not doing anything. Can you guys hear me okay? We can now hear you. Uh, okay. And go ahead please okay thanks mary lou seidel thank you chairman wong and pardon my mark commissioners i am mary lou seidel the director of community engagement for preservation chicago i speak today in support of the chicago landmark designation which is having a modern path at 4339 south lake park avenue in the immortal words of mckinley morgan field this is a story a story that has never been told mary lou you're fading in and out if you could try to be consistent with your uh, with the, with the mic. I'm, uh, can, can you, there you right. go. All right, I'm gonna keep my face really close. Okay. This is a story, a story that has never been told. Blues had a baby and they named it rock and roll. Blues is undeniably the root of modern music. When rock and roll took off and the Chicago blues Mary Lou, it, it is, uh, we're really having a hard time hearing you. Um, what I'd like to do is, um, I am going to come back to you uh, in, a, in a minute, okay? If you could try to figure out how to fix your microphone or call in or something, uh, that would be great. And um, we'll come back to you though, as you uh, uh, try to fix your mic. Uh, I am one of, I do want to uh, follow up with the uh, agenda item number four, the landmark recommendation for the former Schlitz Brewery Tide House um, and hand the mic over to Diane Gonzalez. Can you hear me? We sure can. Sure can. Oh, great. Good afternoon, I'm Diane Gonzalez, a resident and preservationist in the Old Town Triangle District and a member of Preservation Chicago's board. This is the third time that I've come before you regarding 1393 West Lake. Returning today underscores how important it is to landmark this structure. 1393 West Lake, a handsome 1892 storefront with flats above, it's a treasure in the Fulton Market District. We were pleased that it was granted preliminary landmark status in April. And you've heard all about its characteristics and origins as a slitch, slitch, slits a tide house. We know the landmark Fulton Market District is one of Chicago's fastest changing neighborhoods. New hotels, tech centers, and trendy restaurants have arrived in the area that in the 1880s was home to many warehouses for food wholesalers. In the midst of the newcomers sits the venerable 1393 West Lake. Now is the chance to save this historically and architecturally important storefront. Inadvertently, the structure had been granted a demo permit, which was rescinded. Preliminary designation was unanimously granted in April. With the subsequent publicity, it is amazing how many Chicagoans recognize this building, saying they recall it from driving down Lake Street or Ogden Avenue or eating at La Luce. It has handsome turrets, beautiful bays, and distinctive copper trim. For some Chicagoans, this building and the L running overhead were what they knew about this part of Lake Street. On a personal note, and again, this is the third time that I've brought this up, my great grandpa, Antonio Gonzalez, a Spanish immigrant cigar maker who resided on the near west side from 1887 through 1892, was someone who frequented taverns. I like to imagine that he visited the newly built Tide House where he imbibed, imbibed in his Schlitz. For Antonio and the innumerable others who've enjoyed 1393 Westlake, either dining or drinking inside, from noting its facade outside, 1393 Lake deserves designation. It has been granted preliminary landmark status. Let's not go backwards. Please oppose its demolition and grant it permanent landmark status. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Gonzalez. Uh, could we hear from Ward Miller? Mr. Miller, please. Can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? We sure can. All right. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. I'm Ward Miller, Executive Director of Preservation Chicago. We at Preservation Chicago fully support the final landmark recommendation and Chicago landmark designation of the former Schlitz Brewery Tide House, located at 1393 to 1399 West Lake Street on Chicago's near west side. We also want to encourage you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and Mr. Vice Chairman, along with members of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks in the City of Chicago to deny the permit application for demolition of this building. The Schlitz Tide House, the Schlitz Bury Tide House is located at the southeast corner of Lake and Loomis near Ogden Avenue. It's a fine quality building of great craftsmanship and design and constructed in, in, in anticipation of the Chicago World's Fair of 1893, where the famous Schlitz belted globe logo was also formally introduced to the public. The building's overall composition and quality of detailing are outstanding, and the structure is an exemplary example of an early Schlitz Brewery Tide House building. The structure is highly visible, lovely in appearance, and seen for many blocks as one proceeds northward on Ogden Avenue to Lake Street. Its magnificent use of rich materials of red brick, limestone, ornamental copper bays, and corner turret make it a much admired building and part of the Ogden Avenue, Lake Street, and near west side built environment and view shed. The Schlitz Brewing Tide House was surveyed as part of the near west community area in December 1984 and determined at that time, some 37 years ago, to be orange rated and of significance uh, in the Chicago Historic Resources Survey, which itself was published 25 years ago by the city of Chicago. The significance of this building and, uh, has been both recognized by the general public and by the city for decades. And its importance to Chicago's built environment has only increased over the last 40 years. We at Preservation Chicago, we're proud to assist in both research and outreach to the citizens of Chicago, members of the general public, as well as contributing historical information for this preliminary report. We started a change.org petition and it was unlike anything we had seen or encountered at that moment in time and resulted in over 8,315 petition signatures spanning approximately 380 pages with 25 pages of comments, all presented for the record. This is 405 pages of documents representing the opinion of many individuals from Chicago and extending across the nation. And we wanna suggest and offer your consideration of the Schlitz Brewery Tide House on Lake Street as a Chicago landmark. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, before we go on to the next item, uh, I wanna to try to get back to Mary Lou Seidel. Uh, Mary Lou, have you, can you try to log in again? Are you there? Can you hear me? Oh my God. Sort of. Well, um, oh, no. is that better? Okay. That's better. Let's see how this works. So, uh, Mary Moose Idell again, Director of Community Engagement for Preservation Chicago. I speak today in support of the Chicago Landmark designation for the Mary Water House. Mary Lou, I hate to tell you this, but you have just faded out okay. completely. Yeah. I'm, I'm just going to pass, I think. I can't get this one. I will try to, I'm going to go through the next item of speakers okay. and I'm going to come back to you one more time. You may want to call in or something. Thanks. Okay, I'll do that. All right. Um, next item on the agenda is the, uh, well, it says here that four people have signed up to speak regarding agenda item number six, the demo, demolition application for 513 West Fullerton. Uh, however, I only have three, I think, two, three, no, four, sorry. Um, let me start with uh, Mr. Moore. Is there Mr. Moore there? I don't have a first name. Uh, I'm Tom Moore. You I'm can sorry. You hear me? Yes, and you and, and you know you know me. I've been in front of you many times. 
<laughs> um, so I'm here on behalf of the Mid-North Association, which is the uh, community organization that uh, where the Seneca uh, Retreat House is and has been throughout its history. Uh, the Mid-North uh, is one of the original and oldest landmark districts uh, and the association worked with the landmark department uh, to create the district in the, in the 1970s and has continued to work with the department uh, throughout its history. Um, I personally live around the corner from the Seneca Retreat House. Uh, for 50 years next week, uh, we closed on our house uh, and in June of 1971. Uh, the Seneca Sisters have been a integral part of uh, the community. Uh, we've invited them to our block parties and they have invited us to their masses and their receptions. It's been our voting precinct. Their building has been where we voted for all of those years. Um, the community is sad to see them go, um, but um, and it creates some concern as to what will replace this large piece of land. Um, fortunately, there is a plan in place um, it's, and it's contingent upon the demolition of the existing building. Uh, the plan uh, that has the support of the alderman and the community has both multifamily, uh, a multifamily component and single family homes and is consistent with the existing housing in the immediate area. Um, and as I say, it has the support of everybody at this point. Um, the only problem would be if the existing building were demolished and then uh, for whatever reason, the developers or their successors did not do what they say they're going to do. So uh, we would respectfully request that your recommendation to Alderman Tunney's committee and to the city council uh, contain a clause that makes the demolition uh, of the Seneca building contingent upon the developers commitment and documentation of their agreed replacement development plan. And uh, with that, we you have the unanimous support of the um, community organization, the aldermen, and as far as I know, everybody in the area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, next speaker is Catherine Hill. Catherine Hill, if you, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? We sure can. Okay, thank you so much, Chairman Wong, and to the distinguished members of this commission. Um, this testimony is with regards to the demolition permit. Um, my name is Catherine Hill, and I live at 507 West Fullerton, which is next door to the Seneca. Like many of my neighbors, I've enjoyed this property for years with its many stained glass windows, stunning chapel, and green spaces. I was saddened to learn that the sisters of the Seneca were preparing for sale. My building at 507 is part of the Victorian Landmark building at the southwest corner of Cleveland and Fullerton. Victorian Landmark dates to the late 1800s Victorian period and sits on a limestone foundation. When we first learned of the redevelopment, my condo board sought counsel from engineers and attorneys. During these preliminary conversations, it was conveyed to us that below grade construction, including demolition and excavation, poses serious structural risks to our building and many of our neighbors. Sitting on the property line between the 507 West Fullerton and Seneca building are three aspen trees, which I've recently been told could be as old, if not older than the Victorian landmark building itself. These trees have a pr protected status, something um, which we are in the process of documenting. And these trees are also the primary source of shade for our building and our home to various wildlife. Demolition poses serious risks to these protected trees as well. There are a number of other issues that this demolition poses to Victorian Landmark and our neighbors in this historic section of, the, of Lincoln Park none of which uh, include increased traffic on the already busy Fullerton, dust and erosion posing structural danger to our balconies and fences. The Seneca is located in one of Chicago's oldest and most historic neighborhoods. For those of us who live here, it requires great expense to maintain properties of this age. We do so willingly and with pleasure as we know how this contributes to the beauty of our city that so many enjoy. Please do not approve this permit and plan hastily as it poses considerable risk to our homes, the damage for which could be immeasurable. 
We are in the process of engaging in experts to advise us throughout the development and urge your commission to heavily consider and condition approval of these permits on the careful and thoughtful consideration of these issues and preparation of these plans. To this end, we have also circulated a petition which has so far been signed by at least 30 adjacent property owners and members of the community. A copy of this petition has been submitted along with my written testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hill. I also want to note that uh, Commissioner Ponce has joined us for the record, um, as well as Commissioner Tolliver has also joined us. Um, Patrick Stuffis is the next speaker on this uh, item. Mr. Stuffis. Yeah, yes, Mr. Chair and members of the commission, thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Yeah, I wish to say that the Seneca complex, I do feel that the building contributes to the history and character of the Mid-North Historic District. And it now in itself is 54 years old. Um, my thoughts are that this is an excellent example of mid-century modern religious architecture that recalls the work of such architects as Ed Dart and Charles Stade. Although the architect Charles Pope, who lived from 1924 to 1984, does not seem to have designed quite a few buildings, he did design an additional Seneca complex in Warren, Warren View, Warrenville, excuse me, which has since been demolished. And visiting the site, having visited many times over the years, I feel that it's an exceptionally well-designed complex and that it integrates itself well into this dense community and provides much needed open space. These buildings appear to be in excellent condition and can be repurposed into other uses. Although research has been done on Pope's career and we feel that <clears throat> more time is needed for further review. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stephens. Um, I am going to go back to Mary Lou Seidel one last time. Hopefully we can have her get on and uh, speak on agenda item number three, Muddy Waters. Okay, thank you so much. All now right, that I've phoned you in, you. you can hear me. Uh, so Mary Lou Seidel, Director of Community Engagement for Preservation Chicago. I speak today in support of a Chicago landmark designation for the Muddy Waters House at 4339 South Lake Park Avenue. In the immortal words of McKinley Morgan Field, this is a story, a story that has never been told. The blues had a baby and they named it rock and roll. Blues is undeniably the roots of modern music, all ranges of rock and roll, country and rap, and the Chicago blues, especially that served up via the Mississippi Delta is one of the greatest influences of them all. Muddy Waters, Howlin' Wolf, Willie Dixon, Pine Top Perkins, Buddy Guy, Little Walter, Junior Wells, Coco Taylor, James Cotton, Jimmy Rogers, Otis Spann, just a sampling of the extraordinary legends who settled here. Muddy Waters started his recording career in Mississippi and he moved to Chicago in 1943. He lived at 4339 South Lake Park Avenue for 20 years. If those walls could talk, they would tell the story of all the blues legends who came by to jam with Muddy Waters in the basement or stay at his home while they were in town recording or performing. While Wall sadly can't talk, this legendary home can be protected, restored, and opened as the Mojo Museum. Muddy Waters' great-granddaughter, Chandra Cooper, is on track to restore the home and offer interpretation and programming to keep the music alive, the legacy of Muddy Waters alive, and inspire young people to learn more about the blues and perform blues music themselves. Ms. Cooper is hopeful as well to receive her older person's support to acquire the vacant city-owned lot next door for a community garden and other programming space. The Mojo Museum activation of this long vacant lot will be an additional asset to the neighborhood. It is possible to tell stories without the place where they happened, but history is best told within the walls where it went down. Imagine walking through some flamingo decorated front storm doors, descending stairs to the basement and walking among the places McKinley Morgan Field and so many blues legends walked, played and talked. The world loves Chicago blues and it especially loves Muddy Waters. A Chicago landmark designation is an extraordinary way to reflect that love and keep this extraordinary home as a vibrant reflection of Muddy Waters' legacy and the influence of blues music around the world. Thank you for your consideration of this nomination. I did it. Thanks. 
Thank you, Ms. Hedell, appreciate it. Uh, that is all the members of the general public who have signed up to speak for this uh, commission meeting, and we will now go through the agenda. Uh, the first item is the approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, there was a regular meeting of on May 6, 2021, and uh, if uh, I could uh, get a motion to approve that um, uh, those minutes. Is there a motion? I so move. So move. I see uh, Commissioner Aguirre is moving and Commissioner Osmond is second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody uh, uh, opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Item number two is the preliminary landmark recommendation for the Monastery of the Holy Cross, formerly the Immaculate Conception Church. Property is located at 3101 South Aberdeen Street in the 11th Ward. And Dan Kleiber, uh, you have the floor. Great, can you hear me okay? We sure can. Thank you, Chairman Wong. The Monastery of the Holy Cross, formerly Immaculate Conception Catholic Church, is a significant neighborhood religious complex that continues to serve the Bridgeport community area. It was completed in 1909 by a German Catholic parish and served the area as a church until 1990. In 1991, it became the home of the Monastery of the Holy Cross, a Roman Catholic Benedictine monastery. In 2018, Father Peter Funk of the monastery made a suggestion to the Commission on Chicago Landmarks Program Committee that it be designated a Chicago landmark. To orient you, the Monastery of the Holy Cross is located in the Bridgeport community area on Chicago's near southwest side. The church and adjoining rectory building to the south anchors the southeast corner of the intersection of Aberdeen Street and 31st Street. They are shaded in black on the map in front of you. Immediately to the south of the church building's eastern end is a two-story brick flat building that is also owned by the monastery. It is not part of this designation. The monastery meets three criteria for designation, including criterion one, for its significance to the city of Chicago as a neighborhood church that served as an important part of cultural life in Chicago's German community and later other ethnic communities. Early immigration, including German immigration to Bridgeport, was spurred on by the need for workers to man the nearby i &M Canal. The first version of Immaculate Conception Catholic Church to serve the burgeoning German community was constructed in 1883 at Bonfield Avenue between Archer and Lyman Street in a modest frame building. In 1891, Immaculate Conception's third resident pastor, Father Peter L. Bierman, obtained the finances for the construction of a combination church, school, and convent at the present location. The new church was designed for a national parish to serve the German-speaking residents of Bridgeport and was a social and religious hub for Chicago's thriving German-American communities in the early 20th century. The rectory of the church was completed first in 1901, while the church itself was completed during 1908 through 1909. The designation also meets criterion four as a finely crafted example of neighborhood scaled ecclesiastical architecture executed in the Gothic Revival style. The Immaculate Conception Church was built in the Gothic Revival style and was inspired by Germany's Cologne Cathedral, the most significant religious structure in the hometown of the church's architect, Hermann J. Gall. As is common for Gothic Revival churches, the Immaculate Conception Church is a masonry building with structural elements such as tall, narrow windows and a slender tower that accentuate its vertical proportions. Carved stone statuary and brick ornamentation with fine decorative detail used throughout provided an opportunity for Gaul to offer the neighborhood a high style church while also matching the material of surrounding brick cottages and two flats. The designation also meets criterion five for its association with architect Herman J. Gaul. Immaculate Conception is a significant early work of Herman J. Gall, a renowned Chicago-based ecclesiastical architect of the early 20th century. After coming to the United States, Gall settled in Chicago in 1897 and apprenticed for a time with famed architect Louis Sullivan. Gall catered to Chicago's large German-American population, designing an array of buildings throughout the city and beyond that exuded the finest characteristics of German and Gothic revival architecture. 
Examples of Gaul's work in Chicago include St. Philomena Church, St. Benedict Church, St. Francis Xavier Church, and St. Matthias Church. Some of Gaul's designs outside of Illinois include Holy Hill National Shrine of Mary in Erin, Wisconsin, and St. Mary Church and Academy in Indianapolis, Indiana. In addition to the landmark criteria just discussed, the Monastery of the Holy Cross also meets the separate integrity criterion. The monastery possesses good physical integrity displayed through its siting, scale, overall design, and historic relationship to the surrounding area. It retains its historic overall exterior form and a majority of all exterior, exterior materials, features, and detailing. Since the church was completed in 1909, no major additions or alterations have been made to the building. Most historic features, finishes, overall form, footprint, and location of entrances and arrangement of fenestration are intact. Finally, the monastery is located in the 11th Ward, and Alderman Patrick Thompson has expressed his support for the proposed designation. In addition, Father Peter Funk of the monastery is in support of the designation and is here today. Moreover, DPD would like to thank Preservation Chicago and specifically Max Chavez, Mary Lou Seidel, Ward Miller, and Carl Klein, who all helped make the designation report a reality. Therefore, staff recommends that the significant historical and architectural features of the building be identified as all exterior elevations, including roof lines of the church and rectory building and the two-story flat building south of the church's apse and masonry wall parallel to the east-west alley directly south of West 31st Street are both excluded from the significant features. You have a preliminary landmark recommendation to that effect. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Does the commission have any questions for Mr. Kleiberg at this time? If not, uh, uh, Dan, you indicated that uh, Father Peter Funk was here. Um, Father Funk? You have the floor. Father Fung. Hello, can you hear me? We sure can. Very good. Put the video on. Put the video on. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission for hearing our petition today. Uh, Carl and Max and Dan have all done uh, an excellent job of presenting the architectural features of the monastery. And so I would like just to speak of the feasibility of this designation from the perspective of our community commitment to the buildings here and to the community of Bridgeport. Uh, we were invited as a monastery to come to Chicago by Cardinal Bernadine in 1991. So we'll be celebrating 30 years here in July. And during this time, uh, when he invited us, he offered us to choose from several parish churches that had been closed in 1990. And when the brothers arrived here at this church and saw the beauty of the church, the, the great verticality of the interior, uh, and heard the acoustic, we knew right away that this would be our home. And we've now been here for 30 years, as I mentioned. In that time, we've grown uh, from a community of three brothers, permanent brothers, to nine, uh, seven of whom uh, are here today. And uh, we've made a commitment to reassembling the campus. So we were originally uh, given the convent and then uh, the, the church in 2001. Uh, and then we were interested in uh, obtaining the rectory, which we purchased in 1996. And so now we've basically put the campus back together of the original parish. And uh, the, the rectory we wanted from the beginning because uh, of its beauty. Again, it's, it's a unique architecture, which uh, complements the church very well. I should also mention about the church, the windows were, were noted as being significant. They are remarkably beautiful. And the acoustic, we've had uh, prominent choirs from the city of Chicago record in our church because of the acoustic. And a, a noted choir director has referred to our church as the Stradivarius of acoustics. It's that good. And it's a, a real joy to pray seven times a day in the church. 
Benedictines, uh, we are a religious order, so we're part of the Roman Catholic Church, but we have a separate structure from the archdiocese. This means that we no longer run a parish here, but we live here. Uh, all the monks make a vow of stability. That means we are committed for life to living in this place together and uh, being in the church many times uh, throughout the day and praying with the doors open to the public. And uh, so this is an indication of our commitment to being here and remaining here. We have a mixed community of priests and lay brothers. Uh, we have a large uh, group of oblates, lay persons who are associated with the community who make regular visits here and so on. Uh, so uh, with this, we're very grateful that uh, the commission has uh, put us on the agenda today and for all the work of the Historic Preservation Division and Preservation Chicago in preparing us for this meeting. So thank you, and uh, we uh, support this designation, preliminary designation. Thank you, Father Funk. Does the commission have any questions for uh, Father Funk or uh, Dan? I am looking, I'm getting used to the hand, raised hand, so I don't see anybody. Um, but thank you very much. With that then, I'd like to call for a request a motion to adopt the preliminary landmark recommendation for the Monastery of the Holy Cross, formerly the Immaculate Conception Church. Is there a motion? So moved. Okay, uh, Commissioner Ponce moved it. Is there a second? Second, Commissioner Aguirre. Commissioner Aguirre seconds it. I'm gonna do the roll call. Commissioner Tolliver? Yes. Commissioner Hughes? Yes. Commissioner Osmond? Yes. Commissioner Jekovich? Yes. Commissioner Cox? Yes. And I am uh, uh, saying yes to that as well. The motion carries unanimously. Congratulations, and uh, we'll, we'll see you down the road. Thank you so much. Second item on the agenda is the Muddy Waters House, located, this is for a preliminary landmark recommendation uh, for the property located at 4339 South Lake Park Avenue in the Fourth Ward. And uh, Kendallin Hahn, please give us a report. Kendallin, are you with us? I can see her, but I can't hear her. All right, let me unplug here. Can you hear me now? Yeah. We can hear yes, you. Yes, this way. Kamala, were you able to give me the ability to share the screen, please? Great. Thank you so much. Yep. Okay, let me know when you can see that. We're, you're all set. Good. Okay. So, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, before you today for your consideration is a preliminary recommendation for the proposed individual landmark designation of 4339 South Lake Park Avenue. This 1891 structure served as the home of blues musician Muddy Waters and family from 1954 to 1973. The hospitality extended to Chicago's blues community and musicians who came to record or perform in Chicago made the home an unofficial center for the Chicago blues community, a community largely composed of African-Americans whose gifts to the world not only shaped American popular music and subsequent generations of musicians, but one which gave the world a uniquely American art form, which speaks to the incredible resilience of the human spirit. So the home is located on the south side of Chicago in the North Kenwood neighborhood situated along Lake Michigan within the fourth ward. In 1993, the home was included as a contributing property within the Chicago landmark North Kenwood Multiple Resource District, a district which consists primarily of detached homes and row houses built from the 1870s through the 1920s. This home's significance, however, to the city of Chicago, the United States, and beyond rises well above the level of simply being a contributing structure within a district. Staff recommend that the history associated with this individual home meets the requirements needed 
to qualify the home as an individual landmark with a distinct era of significance that deserves to be recognized, protected, and celebrated. Fortunately, the owner agrees and has consented to the designation. Based on the evaluation of the property, the Historic Preservation Division staff believe that the building meets two criteria for Chicago landmark designation, including criterion one for heritage. Blues mu musician McKinley Morganfield, better known as Muddy Waters, was born in rural Mississippi, the son of a sharecropper. Muddy Waters' migration from the Mississippi Delta to Chicago in the middle of the 20th century mirrored the journey of many African Americans who left their homes to flee the Jim Crow South to find better opportunities in Northern urban centers. They brought with them their culture and traditions, which enriched their newfound homes. When Muddy Waters and his contemporaries' musical heritage took root in Chicago and was amplified to reach ever larger crowds, the Chicago blues that emerged sent the heartbeat of America's culture around the world. The Chicago blues created by musicians like Muddy Waters, Willie Dixon, Alan Wolf, Sonny Boy Williamson, and so many others would influence generations of musicians. These artists advanced, sorry, these artists influenced the sound of rock and roll as it emerged in mainstream culture, as acknowledged, for example, by some of the uh, world's best known rock bands, including the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. These Chicago's blues masters recordings first made the charts due largely to, Af to an African-American audience in Chicago and then across the United States, but their audience diversified and expanded across the Atlantic by the 1950s and 60s. Events like the Newport Jazz Festival in 1956 provided national exposure to artists like Muddy Waters. By the early 1950s, independent record companies such as Chess, VJ, Chance, and Parrot and distributors like United and Bronzeville were headquartered around Cottage Grove from 47th to 50th Streets. Muddy Waters Home at 4339 South Lake Park was located near these businesses and the concentrations of blues clubs on 43rd and 47th Streets, such as the original Checkerboard Lounge at 43rd Street, Teresa's Lounge, and dozens more, including Smitty's Corner and Pepper's Lounge shown here. In the years after Water moved into the home in 1954, other music-related professionals moved to the nearby area. Soon, Muddy Water's home turned into a gathering place for other blues musicians and entertainers. Muddy Water Waters offered open-door hospitality at his 4339 South Lake Park Avenue home. Rehearsals were held in the basement. Musicians were welcomed at all hours. Not only food and drink, but lodging was also offered to traveling musicians. Fellow blues legend Helen Wolf stayed there as he resettled himself in Chicago. Chuck Berry, befriended by Waters, stayed at his home while in town to record at Chest Records. Distinguished visitors included performers, many performers uh, such as Buddy Guy, Coco Taylor, Little Walder, B.B. King, the list would go on and on. Staff also found that the home meets criterion three for its association with a person who contributed significantly to the development of the city, state, or nation. Considered by many to be the father of Chicago blues, Muddy Waters was one of the most important figures in the development of the distinctive electrified sound that came to be known as the Chicago blues. He had come to Chicago with an acoustic guitar, but soon found he needed to amplify his sound to be heard in the many clubs where he played, so he bought an electric guitar. Muddy Waters skillfully married the raw acoustic Delta blues he learned in the Mississippi, in Mississippi with amplification to create a powerful new urban sound that could be heard in the loudest of Chicago's nightclubs and beyond. The music recorded by Waters, including I'm a Man and King B, became part of the standard repertoire of English rock and roll bands of the 1960s. Among these imitators were the Rolling Stones, who recorded their own versions of a number of songs by Chicago blues musicians and who took their name from a 1950 Muddy Waters single titled Like a Rolling Stone. Waters later acknowledged the influence of his music on rock with his recording, 
the blues had a baby and they called it rock and roll. Waters recorded with Chicago's chess records from 1947 through 1975. Recordings included hit songs, which reached the top 10 R&B singles charts of Billboard magazine, including Louisiana Blues, Hoochie Coochie Man, I'm Ready, Manish Boy, Close to You, etc. Five of his albums would make the Billboard top 200 from 1969 to 1981. His music was recognized with over six Grammys, over a dozen Blues Foundation Awards, and the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award, and he was posthumously inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1987. Staff are recommending that the significant historical and architectural features of the home be designated as all exterior elevations, including roof lines of the building, and the non-original basement entrance at the front facade, which existed during Muddy Waters' residence and ownership of the building, 1954 to 73, as documented in existing historic photographs, exterior alterations to the building, which are known to have been made by Muddy Waters, specifically the concrete porch with its metal railings and metal canopy, the flat uh, exterior cladding of the bay window at the front facade and the flat profile at the location of the original cornice. New storm doors should be designed to match the customized pair, customized pair of Flamingo storm doors installed by Muddy Waters, which are no longer extant, but which are, as you can see, documented in historic photographs and other exterior alterations to the building made by Muddy Waters that can be documented. Today, we have uh, with us not only the owner um, and a special guest, hopefully, that she was able to, to bring, um, but we have Lisa DeKira of Landmarks, Illinois, who was instrumental and provided the partial first draft of the designation report. Commissioners, you received uh, letters from the National Trust, architects, preservationists, and groups forwarded to you in support of the nomination. And we have Alderman King of the Fourth Ward who wanted to share her comments as well. Please let me know if you have any questions and thanks for your time. Thank you, Kendallin. Oh, my headphones here. Uh, does the commission have any questions for Candlin at this time? If not, uh, I'd like to call on um, Alderman King uh, if you'd like to speak at this time. Alderman King? Hi, Alderman? Chairman. Yes. Sorry, I'm also in a, another committee <laughs> meeting, oh. so I was trying to uh, multitask there. Uh, you, I um, understand. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We sure pretty can. Well? Okay, yep. great, great. Um, so uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Wong, uh, Vice Chair Zikowitz. Uh, can't forget my constituent, Reverend Tolliver, and other distinguished members of the commission. Uh, really appreciate you allowing me to speak here uh, today, um, especially with all of the confusion and misinformation out there on my support for preserving and, and celebrating iconic landmarks, um, especially of African American, excuse me, African American heritage. Um, it, through all that confusion, you know, I picked up the phone and reached out to Ms. Cooper directly uh, to share my feelings and to hear what her concerns were directly. I truly uh, appreciate that dialogue uh, tremendously. Um, I think we both learned a lot um, and are moving in the, in the same direction, which is great. Um, I truly also appreciate this commission, um, as you know, Chairman, uh, I appreciate your independence um, because when we brought the Johnson building before you, um, you stood strong with me uh, when the administration pushed back and wanted to take the Ebony Jet sign down um, and prolonged you know, this very process as a new alderman that was uh, really um, you know, a uh, very disturbing uh, process, um, but I appreciated um, how the commission uh, listened um, and understood. Um, and that juxtaposed to uh, us landmarking the Essex building, you know, a couple doors down with the same type of signage, um, you know, really just brought uh, to bear um, how inequities kind of play out in planning. Um, and so I really appreciate you guys and, and your independence. 
Um, you know, same thing we're experiencing with Disable now, we experienced with Ida, Ida B. Wells. Um, just, you know, every excuse not to move forward and do what's right. Um, you know, they were talking about the marketing that the Ebony Jet sign uh, would cause, you know, the building not to be marketed. Uh, the same thing they're saying about our city if we change um, Dusable Drive um, and just a lot of unconscious bias and actually intentional bias that are playing out. Um, so really, truly appreciate your support when um, I was very uh, young in my years as an alderman and making sure uh, that the Ebony Jet sign stayed up. Um, it was original to the building and should have, uh, but we're talking about muddy waters today. Um, and I don't want to lose sight of that and the great contributions uh, that he has made as people has, have spoken so eloquently about to our city, to our country, um, truly to the world. Um, um, and, you know, this house is an, an important part of that story and needs to be treated as such. Um, as people may or may not know, you know, my family comes from uh, the Mississippi Delta, which is not that big. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is truly personal for me as well. My grandfather uh, would be proud of me because he taught me to drive, you know, in literally the backwoods of the Mississippi Delta. Um, my mother picked cotton there. Uh, my uncle had to flee there when he was 16 um, because of fear of lynching. Um, so, you know, I've lived these stories and to have somebody uh, like Muddy Waters um, who really put the blues and rock and roll on the stage, not just here in Chicago, but, you know, across the country and the world. Um, I'm personally proud to elevate someone uh, from my hometown area, one of the poorest counties uh, in, in the world, also, um, and so all the challenges that I know he was faced with to, um, you know, uh, break down such barriers and um, do su such significant things. Um, this is a no brainer for me. I shared this with Ms. Cooper, um, you know, I personally support landmarking this house. Uh, that's never been in question for me. Um, I will say that generally the administration works with our office a bit better uh, to make sure that the community's views and mine are incorporated in this presentation. I think that got lost um, in planning somewhere along the line. Uh, that's not uh, Ms. Cooper's fault or uh, any layman's fault. That's something that we need to do better um, with. Um, because I don't generally get out in front of my community, as you know, um, it's really important for me to hear from them first. Uh, we'll, we will be hearing from them um, this Monday. Um, but, you know, in lieu of all the confusion, I wanted to uh, let Ms. Cooper know that uh, personally, I um, support uh, landmarking uh, the Muddy Waters House. Um, I think um, it would elevate um, and continue to elevate him um, in the way that he needs to be elevated um, in our city, especially um, as much as he has done um, from uh, for our city. Um, you know, I will have formal uh, presentation after I hear from the community. I'm happy uh, that uh, Ms. Cooper will be joining us on Monday at that uh, meeting as well. You know, I shared with her um, also that the community is excited too about uh, landmarking and elevating uh, muddy waters. Uh, um, and so uh, that's not um, something you know, that we uh, want to get in the way of. We only want to proceed forward as we normally do with uh, community input. Um, and then my support uh, will come, you know, right after that. Um, so uh, just as this commission has a lot of questions, um, the community does as well. They would love to see the presentation. And like I said, that will happen on Monday. And again, just want to uh, share my appreciation that Ms. Cooper uh, will be attending along with the department um, to answer those questions. And then we look forward to circling back um, with our support. So thank you, um, Chairman um, and the rest of the commission for allowing me again to speak today. Um, I do appreciate the time. Thank you, Alderman King. And um, we look forward to your community meeting on Monday and uh, the outcomes of that. Uh, I do want to, um, uh, before we move on to uh, Ms. Cooper and Ms. Uh, Tiquiera, I did want to remind that 
uh, the commission is here to look at the qualifications, the requirements of the criteria of uh, whether this meets landmark status or not. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Cooper and Ms. DiChiara, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. This is Lisa DiChiara from Landmarks, Illinois. Uh, Chandra, are you on? I don't want to take um, the, uh, Yes, I'm what? on. Thank you. OK. OK. Chandra, Thank would you. you like to go ahead, or do you want me to? I'm sure I will be very quick. I just want to say thank you for allowing me to speak today. Also, I have my mother here, Miss Amelia Cooper, who actually lived in the house um, for several years and several of her formative years. Um, so thank you, commissioners, and, and thank you for everyone who is here and speaking on behalf of the support for this landmark. I just want to make it clear as the owner of the building that I am for this process. I also want to speak on behalf of the family of McKinley Morganfield, AKA Muddy Waters. We believe it is essential culturally and for the legacy of African-American history that this home is designated a city of Chicago landmark. Muddy Waters is, as we've said many times here, is considered the father of Chicago blues. And as some of you may know, and if you don't know, visitors from across the world come today to this city and visit that house on a yearly basis. So we're just asking that this house um, is just given its due diligence and being made a landmark. This house is worthy of a landmark designation and due to its history and significance. I also wanna say um, in regards to Alderwoman's King um, statement that it's essential that um, the landmark and our advocates are at the meeting because they can speak to the whole process of landmarking and the significance of this um, house. And I wanna give it to those professionals to have that platform to do that on Monday because they know the significance, they know the criteria and they're the best ones to speak about this house and the importance of why it should be a landmark. One second, I just wanna see if my mom wants to speak very uh, briefly, Amelia. Um, I just wanted to say as the granddaughter of Muddy Waters and actually living in the house from 1956 to 1973, I am without words with this acknowledgement. And it would be a great bonus to the blues world and to our family to have this acknowledgement. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lisa? Thank you, Chairman and members of the commission. Lisa DiChiara, Director of Advocacy for Landmarks Illinois. Um, I just wanted to just give everyone um, a, a brief update on uh, progress with the House, uh, because I think that will be of interest to the commissioners. And uh, again, of course, Landmarks Illinois is in full support of this preliminary landmark designation. Uh, we included the Muddy Waters House on our annual Most Endangered Historic Places list in 2013. That's when Chandra Cooper and I first got to know each other and started a years long relationship of uh, Landmarks Illinois giving assistance to her and her efforts with the Mojo Museum. Uh, in 2020, it was, despite the pandemic, we had a very busy year and a productive year. Um, we uh, worked with uh, Klein and Hoffman um, and Berglund Construction to do a uh, pro bono condition assessment of the home which was very important because that was uh, what was needed to help with determining not only um, what the essential and priority repair needs are for the home, but also how to cost them out and also proceed with fundraising efforts. Um, Landmarks Illinois worked with Chandra to prepare a grant application to the National Trust for Historic Preservation to their African-American Cultural Heritage Action Fund which resulted in a $50,000 grant, uh, which has enabled uh, critical repairs to the roof. Uh, Landmarks Illinois went on to also give a grant to the Mojo Museum from our Timuel D. Black Jr. grant for Chicago's South Side. Mojo Museum was actually the first recipient of this newly established grant fund that we created last year. 
And uh, so that has ha helped with uh, essential matching funds for the ongoing fundraising. Um, it was in coordination with staff of the Historic Preservation Division, DPD, that it was agreed upon that this individual landmark designation would be appropriate. As uh, Candelin uh, noted in her presentation, the, the home has already been a contributing building to the North Kenwood Multiple Resource Historic District for a number of years. But we all agreed um, in meetings early uh, last year, even before the pandemic, that an individual landmark designation would be appropriate, primarily because, as we know, again, as Kendallin pointed out, that the years of, um, of focus of the North Kenwood District really ends before Muddy Waters took uh, ownership and residency of the home. So the whole point of the individual landmark designation, despite the fact that the home is already protected under the current district, uh, as well as um, Chandra has gone under permit review and, and has done all of those processes that we are familiar with, um, was because that period of significance really needed to hone in on Muddy Waters um, era with the home. And as Candelin noted, he did make, he and his wife did make significant um, changes to the home that are visible on the exterior and are very special to his period there. Not only the, um, the, the doors uh, that uh, she showed a picture of, Candelin showed a picture of, but other certain changes that again were made to really accommodate um, his use of the home as again explained in the presentation. So we think that's really significant as the um, ongoing efforts go to rehabilitate the home, that this is not to uh, replicate what it looked like during its earliest years or its year of construction, but really to focus in on the period um, of Muddy Waters residency with his wife and family. Um, so with that, we were very happy to help uh, prepare this landmark designation report and um, also, we brought in uh, two Loyola University public history students who are also embarking on a National Register nomination of the home currently. And we are working with the State Historic Preservation Office uh, and Chandra on that effort as well. So I'm happy to answer any questions uh, going forward as well. And again, many thanks to Chandra for her years of um, stewardship and her efforts to bring this home back and to make it available to the public. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Chandra. Thank you, Amelia. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, uh, is there, are there any questions for um, uh, any of these uh, either um, Candelin or uh, Lisa or Chandra that anybody would like to ask. I don't see any hands up. I do have a real quick question, Lisa. Maybe you could answer this. There was a uh, there was a differentiation of the photos of the facade of the house. Uh, I believe there was a black and white photo from '64. I think it was that showed the front porch, uh, a different awning. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and um, it may even be that um, Chandra's mother would like to address it too, since she was there when those changes took place. She was living there. But um, you're right, you're seeing different photos of different periods of time during Muddy Rod Waters' uh, ownership and residency of the home. Um, when the um, wonderful Pelican storm doors were installed, that front porch was still wood. Um, and then at a later point in time, uh, as you see it today, the changes were made to the railing and to the, um, uh, to the overhang. Uh, and so those are the elements that today uh, reflect uh, a later period of, of their lives there where again, they made changes on an ongoing basis. Um, so Chandra or Amelia, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Um, the reason that the porch, I believe it was changed from the wood to the cement was because at that period, I think it had sort of like dry rotted out. And um, 
one of the biggest things with uh, Muddy Wife was she liked it to sit on the front porch. So that's how they decided to concrete it and put up the male railings because it was more secure. And we had tenants upstairs as well. Great, thank you. Uh, so the intent though is to restore it um, kind of as it is now. Okay. Um, any other questions? Anybody? Okay, well, having none. Um, Commissioner Aguirre has a question. Oh, Commissioner Aguirre, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, it's more of a comment. Um, I'm just really thrilled to see um, projects like this um, being supported and being elevated through uh, landmark status. Um, we are very excited to see this um, space uh, with the legacy uh, of Muddy Waters being elevated and celebrated and um, hopefully in, in the future, in the very near future, invested on. So every Chicagoan um, has an opportunity to learn more about this super valuable heritage. So I just want to commend you on your energy and being stewards, um, and we look forward to supporting this. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Gary. Commissioner Cox. Uh, yes, I too want to uh, just offer a comment because I'm always, I'm always taken by um, the the work, the effort, the dedication, the stick to itiveness that it takes for family to come forward to preserve uh, a legacy, uh, not for themselves but to honor. Uh, a really important cultural figure uh, and to share that, continue to share that with the rest of the world. So I just thank you for your stick to and your tenacity uh, to do this. Uh, and I think um, the story of Muddy, Muddy Waters is really wrapped up in that house. Uh, and the idea that such an extraordinary, you know, cultural contribution came from a simple, house uh, on South Lake uh, Park Avenue. Uh, and so, so often the, the brilliance that um, African-Americans have given to this country uh, is wrapped up in the everyday and the ordinary. And most people would not even know it if we didn't go through this extra effort to preserve that everyday context uh, that helped the man make this extraordinary music that really changed the world. So uh, it's really important to us that uh, we celebrate um, our culture mm -hmm. wherever it lies. Uh, and the first step is when those who are stewards of that culture decide to step in and do the hard work. Uh, and uh, I think it helps, makes our work a lot easier. Uh, and it also, um, I think attracts not only attention, but resources so that we can all play a part. And so I look forward to the city assisting um, at, that, at the time when it is appropriate uh, to make sure that you can continue to share this house with, uh, with everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you so much, Commissioner Cox. Thank you, everyone. And looking forward to the advocates and also um, the historians to tell this story and to educate people in the city of Chicago and the neighborhood in the fourth ward as well um, on Monday. Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, does anybody else have anything? Uh, Commissioner Hughes, please. Yes, I, I, I wanna echo um, my fellow commissioner comments and thanking the family. I have, uh, I have a confession. I've totally been uh, listening to Muddy Waters uh, for the past couple of weeks and I am just in love. Um, and I know that I've heard this music before when I was a really young child, uh, but obviously couldn't comprehend. And, and you know, you, you learn more about the rhythm as a kid. And now I, I learn more about the culture and context and the words. Um, that he sang with the music, which has just been, it's been, I'm, I'm very excited that this is happening. Um, I'm very excited that more of these efforts are happening in African American communities as well. I want to really, really stress that because um, oftentimes our history does get erased. And also we, 
just similarly to the Emmett Till house, these are modest structures, but guys, we are rich in culture and we are rich in, um, you know, heritage and just bringing about, um, you know, what matters to a community outside of materialism. And so it means a lot to me that these structures, these modern structures are being um, saved um, and shared uh, so that we can educate and continue to pass our stories down. So thank you, thank you, thank you again. Thank you, Commissioner Hughes. If nobody else has, I, I guess I have one more comment and that is as a native uh, Kenwood residence growing up, in Kenwood. Uh, my mother actually wanted me to be a concert pianist and was totally aghast because I ended up playing the blues. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, of which there was a great influence um, on the South Side. So, <laughs> um, I, I, I truly appreciate that. Uh, and no, Eddie Torres, I, I see you there. I'm not going to play for you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Commissioner, I, Commissioner, I did have a uh, comment. Um, Go ahead. I actually have a question. Yeah. Um, I, we're, we're, so we, we're, I'm working with Chandra and the Cooper family in the Mojo Museum on, um, on restoring this facade. And um, we're still continuing looking for uh, any images of, of the house. We have slivers and we have not the full facade, but if anybody out there uh, has a photo of the facade during the period of significance, um, and um, one of the challenging things here is, is going to be restoring this house, um, this facade where, you know, keeping the concrete and keeping these elements, which you normally would not, in our normal preservation approach, we would get rid of all these things and put it back to what it was originally in Victorian age. But in this case, this is a really special, um, a special uh, approach and restoration. There's not document, there's not a lot of documentation of photographs of and, 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 and maybe clear photographs to determine the materials, what were the materials that we're gonna, we're gonna have to restore to. Um, it, this is a fun project. I'm honored to be working with the Cooper family and the Mojo Museum on this uh, iconic, myself as a musician also and, and preservation architect. Um, so uh, that was my question. If anybody does have or knows anyone from the neighborhood, perhaps <laughs> Ernie, uh, Commissioner Wong, perhaps you or Chairman Wong, maybe somebody in your family might have taken photos, but that would be nice if we can, uh, uh, you could share that with the uh, Mojo Museum and then that would get to the team that is helping, uh, at least beginning as funds come in, beginning the restoration process of the, of the facade uh, uh, of the building, so. Okay, no, absolutely, thanks, Eddie. Appreciate that. Uh, Sorry, I finally Tolliver. got my photo here. So. Oh, there you go. <laughs> All right. Um, Commissioner Tolliver. You're on mute, uh, Commissioner Tolliver. There you okay, go. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you hear me now? We sure can. Okay. Your uh, comment about your mother being aghast that you wanted to set, play the blues uh, reminds me of of a, a statement that would show that the African-American community is not monolithic on that subject either. Uh, and that's great. Uh, a couple months ago, someone was here to help, uh, help seek help to preserve the former Pilgrim Baptist Church, uh, which will one day be a site to preserve gospel music. And the late Mahalia Jackson, gospel singer, uh, renowned, once was asked on the Ed Sullivan show with her voice, why wouldn't she sing the blues rather than the gospel, gospel music? And she said, blues are songs of despair, gospel are songs of hope. So I sang songs of hope. Uh, and both genres are elevated in the African-American community. Uh, the uh, Professor, a professor at Harvard, Annette Gordon-Reed, just recently published a book called On Juneteenth. And in the beginning chapter, she says, although Juneteenth is a Texas holiday, it's being embraced nationally because all groups have a need for legend, myth, as well as history to uh, give them, them a sense of of identity. And so 
the more of these diverse landmark uh, entities we affirm, it helps solidify those myths, those legends, as well as history uh, in the African-American community. Thank you, Commissioner Tolliver. And I will recommend that um, folks read Leroy Jones' uh, books on the blues as well. Yes. I have them from graduate school days, sitting on yep. my shelf. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> All right. Um, that being said, if we could, uh, I'd like to request a motion to adopt the preliminary landmark recommendation for the Muddy Waters House. Is there a recommendation? So moved. All right, Commissioner Hughes. Is there a second? Seconded by Commissioner Cox. Commissioner Cox. I'll do the roll call. Commissioner Tolliver. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Osmond. Yes. Commissioner Djokovic. Yes. Commissioner Ponce. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Commissioner Aguirre. Yes. And I vote yes as well. The motion carries unanimously. Congratulations uh, the, to the Coopers and, um, and uh, uh, Preservation Chicago and, and Landmarks Illinois. Thank you so much uh, for all the work. Okay, uh, last item on here. Uh -oh, I'm getting lost here. Uh, item number four is a report from the public hearing and final landmark recommendation for the former Schlitz Brewery Tide House at 1393 to 1399 West Lake Street in the 27th Ward. Um, I wanna announce that a two-part public hearing was held on May 12th the first part of the hearing was regarding the proposed landmark designation of the former Schlitz Brewery Tide House at 1393 to 1399 West Lake Street. Before I call on staff for a presentation, let me reiterate that the public hearing was a forum for introducing the evidence and cross-examining witnesses for the proposed des designation. The commission has received copies of, uh, of any received correspondence, as well as the transcript, documents, exhibits, and proposed findings and conclusions from the public hearing. Uh, however, I will allow brief comments from the property owner should he wish, wish to address the commission. And Steve DeGraff, if you would let us know what's going on. Hi there. Hi. Okay, thank, thank you, uh, Commissioner Wong and, and commissioners. My name is uh, Steve DeGraff. Um, I'm an attorney in Chicago, been practicing law for 30 years plus, uh, primarily in real estate. And um, as you can imagine, part of my background and training uh, has to do with um, due diligence and analysis. That's what I do for clients. I would I'd do it for myself. Um, as it relates to this particular parcel, the old the former La Luce site, um, we started the process uh, the ownership team here started the process approximately four years ago, um, late 2018, in acquiring uh, the site immediately to the east of this site. Uh, this particular site is is uh, 22 by 125, I believe, and so it it, it finishes out the uh, the rectangle piece that we have to just to the east of it. Um, as part of the uh, part of the uh, aggregation of the uh, project. We, uh, we did a tremendous amount of due diligence. And that included meeting with city officials and dealing with uh, city information, public information that you can find, talking to development partners, and uh, also working with the neighbor next door who's now building a 20 plus story apartment building on either side of these are, are 20 plus story apartment buildings were recently built and being built. And we created, uh, spent, tremendous amounts of money, millions of dollars, uh, and, and are on the hook for many more dollars to help create a, a green space, a permanent dog park that is um, on the corner now of Ogden and Lake that will be as part of the construction of the Marquette building going up as we speak uh, and creating permanent uh, vacant space over uh, vacated Loomis Street directly to the west of this property. Um, you know, uh, we continue to do everything we 
we thought we could do. Uh, we investigated this. I'd be remiss to say to you that uh, I've heard now twice uh, today and before that the, that the building permit, uh, the, the demolition permit was issued inadvertently on this project. Um, that, that, that'd be hard to reconcile with because that word would mean neglect or malfeasance. Uh, uh, and, and I don't think that's the case. In 2016, the city uh, had an opportunity when a Permit application, demo application was was uh, uh, was was applied for by the previous owner, and it was never acted on, and it, it was it was allowed. Uh, same thing for when we applied, it was granted. So today we sit here now uh, in a position to defend what uh, we spent millions of dollars trying to investigate and do, and knowing that we could because that's what all the information that and due diligence allowed for and and for this for this to be denied or to be landmarked at this particular time the landmark process did not even start until after the demolition permit was immediately or three or four days later after we had already spent uh, four days inside demoing the building uh, uh, pulled uh, with with again without any any knowledge on our part that that was even appropriate because 90 days had passed and the orange status went away and, and we were granted the demo permit. By, by doing this now, not only are we adversely impacted, but highly prejudiced. And since we relied on, to our detriment, everything that I've been trained to do and my partners have been trained to do throughout, if we knew about this in advance, we never would have purchased this property as part of an overall development. So with that said, I, I appreciate uh, your consideration and understanding of what we are going through and dealing with uh, as a result of now being faced with uh, the hearing today. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. DeGraff. Does uh, the commission have any questions for Mr. DeGraff? If not, I'd like to call in Commissioner Drekovich who is a hearing officer uh, for this uh, project uh, for the report and uh, Commissioner Jekovich. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the, the virtual public hearing on the proposed landmark designation for the former Schlitz Brewery Tide House at 1393 to 1399 West Lake Street was held Wednesday, May 12th, 2021 at 10 a.m. and was simulcast to the general public via a link available on at chicago.gov slash CCL. The purpose of the hearing was to gather relevant facts and information to assist the commission in deciding whether 1393 to 1399 West Lake Street meets the criteria for landmark designation set forth in section 2-120-620 of the Municipal Code. I was the hearing officer on behalf of the commission. Copies of, of the public hearing transcripts and exhibits have been distributed to the commission members. Uh, the commission staff the commission staff presentation recommending the proposed landmark designation was given by Kendall and Han, project coordinator of the Historic Preservation uh, Division. At the conclusion of the staff presentation, the commission's rules and regulations allow the property owner and or the representatives to question the staff. The applicant's attorney asked staff to confirm whether a demolition permit had been issued in April 2016 for the subject property. Staff responded that as confirmed with the Department of Buildings, no demolition permit had been issued in 2016. The applicant's expert witness made a, pre made a presentation on their report, which included a discussion of the criteria for landmark designation. DPD's attorney cross-examined cross the expert witness. The applicant's attorney subsequently redirected the expert witness. I asked the expert witness whether there were other examples of Queen Anne style tide houses that did not bear the globe logo. The expert witness responded that yes, several of them, and, and several of them were shown in his presentation. I also asked whether there was a, a mention of the ghost logo in his presentation and the expert witness responded that there was not. Two members uh, of the general public made statements in support of the proposed landmark designation. The total length of the hearing was one hour and 30 minutes. Based on the information and testimony presented at the public hearing, the record of the public hearing and the entire record for the commission, before the commission, I recommend that the former Schlitzbury Tide House at 1393 to 1399 West Lake Street meets three criteria for landmark designation. 
set forth in the municipal code and recommend that the commission on Chicago landmarks recommend to the city council that the building be designated Chicago landmark. I would now like to call upon Kendall and Han for a brief presentation. Okay, hopefully you can hear me now. Yeah. Appreciate it, thank you. So again, my name is Candelyn Hahn and I'm a project coordinator with the Historic Preservation Division. The building at 1393 to 99 West Lake was built as a Schlitz Brewery Tide House. Brewery Tide Houses were buildings owned by breweries which housed saloons selling only the alcohol produced by that brewer. Many breweries utilized this approach amidst increasing competition and pricing wars, but Schlitz had the largest number of Tide Houses in Chicago. The building is located in the near West Side neighborhood in the 27th Ward at the southeast corner of Lake and Loomis Streets. Based on the evaluation of the Lake Street property, the commission preliminarily found that the building meets three criteria for landmark designation, including criterion one for heritage. The production and consumption of alcohol reflects the economic and social heritage of the city from its earliest days when breweries like Lil and Diversi produced beer and taverns like the Green Tree and the Saganash Hotel served customers. As the city's population grew, so did the number of saloons. Prior to the arrival of the brewery tide houses, Chicago's saloons were usually architecturally indistinguishable from other storefront buildings. By the 1880s, there were 33 breweries, uh, 33 breweries in Chicago, making the city the sixth largest producer of beer in America. But Milwaukee-based based Schlitz had also established a presence in Chicago after the Great Fire destroyed many of the city's breweries here. German immigrant Edward Uline directed Schlitz's Chicago market and led the brewery's Tide House building campaign here in Chicago. One of the earliest, earlier properties purchased by Uline was 1393 West Lake Street. The Chicago Tribune announces this, uh, notice announces the sale of the lot to Uline in 1891. A permit was issued for construction of the present building in 1892 to the Joseph Schlitz Brewing Company. This 1892 rasher map confirms the structure was completed that year. As with other Schlitz Brewery Tide Houses, 1393 was located on the corner of a highly traveled street, Lake Street. Here it's circled in red. Edward Uline knew that the Lake Street Elevated was under construction, and one year after his building went up, the new Sheldon Station would deposit commuters directly in front of the building. The commission also found, preliminarily found, that the former Schlitz Brewery Tide House meets Criterion 4 for exemplary architecture and its overall quality of design executed in traditional materials, including pressed brick, cut stone, cast iron, and pressed copper. Large breweries like Schlitz had the funds to commission high quality buildings for both their breweries and their saloons as exhibited in the Lake Street Tide House. Typically, Tide Houses concentrated the most architectural treatment of the front facade, but the site characteristics of 1393 Lake Street called for a different approach. The elevated line directly in front of the structure obscured views of the facade from multiple angles. So although decorative and textured limestone were used on the front elevation, the more detailed copper work was featured on the bay window and corner turret where it could be seen to best advantage. Most Schlitz Brewery Tide Houses were designed in the Queen Anne style and later also the related German Renaissance Revival style. Lake Street is the Queen Anne style emphasized by its asymmetric composition, corner turret with conical roof, box bay window and variety of ornament. The most striking feature of 1393 is the copper clad turret which which rests atop a base supported by three curved brackets extending from a central profiled cast iron column marking the entrance to the saloon. The Queen Anne style also emphasized visual interest through variety as shown on the front facade with its mix of smooth and rough faced stone rendered in checkerboard patterns and fan shaped lunettes. The commission also preliminarily found property meets criterion six as part of a thematic collection of brewery-related architecture in Chicago. This is not the first Tide House to come before the commission. 
In 2011, the commission approved the designation of nine former Schlitz Brewery Tide House structures and a 10th structure was approved last year. The 10 buildings are located throughout the city as shown on the slide. Like the others, the Tide House on Lake Street conveys important aspects of Chicago and American history, including the rise of the Tide House system in Chicago, which reflects the economic might of the brewing companies, the role of immigration in the brewing industry, and the national debate about alcohol consumption that le eventually led to prohibition. Like many commercial property owners, breweries used attractive buildings to attract customers. But Tide House architecture was also emblematic of the brewing industry's response to increasing social pressure brought about by the temperance movement. Through their buildings, they tried to project a more respectable, socially responsible image amidst growing opposition to drinking establishments. Mm -hmm. Breweries took the store and flat building typically used for saloons and elevated it through the use of popular sty styles and a higher architectural quality. So in addition to the landmark criteria discussed, the commission preliminarily found that 1393 West Lake also meets the separate integrity criterion. The building underwent a restoration sometime after 1987. The roof was rebuilt and the copper treatment of the bay window and corner turret were brought back. The storefront system, windows and doors are not original, but these are considered reversible changes. Some areas of brick at the west elevation have been uh, somewhat abraded. A small portion of the storefront opening cast iron pieces are broken or rusted and short sections of the above grade foundations show deterioration, all typical and reversible conditions. So the significant historical arch and architectural features proposed by the commission are all exterior elevations, including roof lines of the building. However, the non-historic one-story frame structure at the rear shown here is excluded from the proposed designation. This concludes my designation, or sorry, this concludes my presentation for the des uh, proposed designation. Thank you. Thank you, Kendallin. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Jekovic. Does the commission have any questions uh, for Commissioner Jekovic or uh, for Kendallin or any discussion? Seeing none, I'd like to request a motion to adopt the final landmark recommendation of City Council for the former Schlitz Brewery Tide House, located at 1393 to 1399 West Lake Street. Is there a motion? So moved. And this, uh, Commissioner Tolliver, uh, is there a second? Yeah. Uh oh, I can't hear you. Repeat that again. I, I I didn't catch that again. Oh, Commissioner Osmond, was that you? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, let me do the uh, the roll call. Commissioner Hughes. Yes. Commissioner Jekovic. Yes. Commissioner Ponce. Yes. Commissioner Geary. Yes. Commissioner Cox. Yes. And I am. Uh, voting yes as well. The motion carries unanimously and uh, we will go on to the next item, which is the report from the public hearing and final decision on permit application for the demolition of a, of a building pursuant to, to um, <coughs> excuse me, 2-120-740 through 2-120-825 of the municipal code of the former Schlitz Brewery Tide House, located at 1393 to 1399 West Lake Street uh, in the 27th Ward. Um, before I begin this item, I'd like to note that all of the commissioners have received the full record of the public hearing conducted on this matter, including the transcript to review. The public hearing on this application was the second part of the public hearing held on May 12th. Uh, Commissioner Maurice Cox will recuse himself from the vote in accordance with the commission's rules and regulations, which state that the commissioner of the Department of Planning and Development or his representative shall recuse themselves uh, from any vote by the commission on any final decision of a permit application. Uh, the commission's rules and regulations provide that the commission shall only consider evidence or testimony, testimony included in the record of the hearing in determining whether to approve or disapprove the permit applications. For that reason, we also will not allow any additional evidence or testimony from the parties today. 
However, I'll let I'll allow brief comments from the property owner should he wish to address the commission. <laughs> so, Mr. DeGraff, uh, would you like to make an additional comment? Okay. Um, hearing that, uh, I will call on Commissioner Jakovic for the hearing officer's findings and recommendation. And so, floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman Wong. The following is a brief summary of the chronology of events relating to the Commission's involvement with permit application number 1009-01650 for the proposed demolition of the building located at 1393 to 1399. West Lake Street. The demolition application was received by commission staff on December 2nd, 2020. At its regular meeting of April 1st, 2021, the commission voted to preliminary, dis preliminarily disapprove the application. The commission found that the, the demolition of the former Schutz Brewery Tide House is contrary to the, to the criteria of Article 3, Section G3A of the Rules and Regulations and per, and per Section G3B is a per se adverse effect on the historical on the significant historic historical and architectural features of the property. On April 12, 2021, commission staff issued a letter to the applicant notifying them of the preliminary disapproval of the application. A public hearing was held on May 12, 2021, in accordance with the landmarks ordinance and the rules and regulations. Veritas Chicago, which owns the property located at 1393 to 1399 West Lake Street was represented at the public hearing by council. <clears throat> at the hearing, the applicants and the Department of Planning and Development were granted party status, presented their, argu presented their arguments and evidence and called their witnesses. The public was also given an opportunity to provide statements. I have previously submitted the commission to the commission the record of the public hearing. Based on the evidence and testimony presented at the public hearing, the arguments of the parties, the record of the public hearing and the relevant criteria for reviewing permit applications, I recommend that the commission approve the permit application for the demolition of 1393 to 1399 West Lake Street. I have reached this conclusion based on the evidence. One, pursuant to Article 3, Section G3B of the commission's rules and regulations, I find that the demolition of the building would have a per se adverse effect on the significant historical and, and architectural features of the building. Two, I find that the demolition of the building would be contrary to criterion one of Article 3, Section G3A. Uh, three, I find that the demolition of the building would be contrary to the Commission's guidelines for alterations of historic buildings and new construction, specifically with respect to the portions of those guidelines relating to demolition. And four, I find that the demolition of the building would violate standards one, two, five, and six of the U.S. Secretary of the Interior Standards for Re Rehabilitation and Guidelines for Rehabilitating Historic Buildings. I would like to add <clears throat> for the record that in preparing my findings and conclusions, I reviewed the entire record of the public hearing. I have drafted proposed findings of fact and conclusions which were sent to commission members. Therefore, I recommend that the commission adopt the proposed CCL findings of fact and conclusions as its own. This concludes my statement. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Jekovic. Um, does the commission have any questions for Commissioner Jekovic? at this time or any discussion regarding this matter. If none, I'd like to request a motion to adopt the hearing officer's proposed findings and conclusions in their entirety as the findings and conclusions of the commission. I note that by adopting these findings and conclusions, the commission will be disapproving the permanent application for demolition of the former Schlitz Brewery Tide House at 1393 to 1399 West Lake Street. Is there a motion? So move. Okay, Commissioner, Commissioner Gary moves it. Is there a second? Second. Second, Commissioner, second. Commissioner Ponce. I'll do the roll call. Commissioner Tolliver. Yes. Commissioner Hughes. Yes. Commissioner Osmond. Yes. Commissioner Jekowitz. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Cox, you have uh, recused yourself. I vote yes on this matter. Uh, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Jekowitz, for your service. I really appreciate it. I know that hearing officer takes a tremendous amount of time, and um, uh, we truly appreciate that. We'll go on to the next item, which is the preliminary decision 
fund permit application for the demolition pursuant to 2-120-740 through 2-120-825 of the municipal code for the property located at 513 West Fullerton Avenue in the 43rd Ward. This is the Mid-North District. And Larry, uh, sure, if you could um, please tell us what's going on. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the applicants initially contacted city staff in the spring of 2021 uh, to discuss demolition of the existing complex and subdivision and redevelopment of the property. They're in the process of preparing a more complete submittal for the proposed redevelopment of the property, which will come before the permit review committee at a future meeting. However, staff received a demolition permit application on April 30th, which requires placement on the next available commission agenda. The project is subject to the provisions of section 2-120-825 of the Municipal Code of Chicago, governing review of permits for the demolition of 40% or more of any building or structure, either designated as a Chicago landmark or located in any district designated as a Chicago landmark. So as we do when we evaluate proposals for demolition, the ordinance has established criteria to evaluate those buildings to determine if they are contributing, which is historic, or non-contributing, which is non-historic for the purposes of this particular district. Uh, we'll run through all these criteria one by one. Uh, criteria one is that the subject property exhibits the general historic and architectural features described in the designation ordinance. The 1977 landmark designation ordinance, which is included in your packet for the Mid-North District states the following. The Mid-North District vividly portrays the character of the typical Chicago residential neighborhood at the end of the 19th century and contains excellent examples of the various building types and architectural styles that predominated during the period when Chicago was rebuilding itself after the Great Fire of 1871. And the Mid-North District contains many excellent examples of three architectural styles which were prevalent throughout the United States at the end of the 19th century, the Italianate, the Queen Anne, and the Romanesque Revival. And in addition, the district also chronicles popular building types from the Chicago Cottage to the row houses of the late 19th century to contemporary townhouses, providing a rare and splendid collection of fine city houses representing the major types characteristic of middle-class housing in old Chicago, preserved in historical context with few intrusions, beautifully restored and lovingly maintained. As described in detail in the Mid-North District Designation Ordinance, the historic development of the district occurred beginning in the 1870s as urbanization increased and the buildings began to be constructed closer together. Transit to the area increased with the establishment of horse car lines and streets paved with wooden blocks. In 1900, the Northwestern Elevated Railroad began to serve the north side, leading to an exodus in the neighborhood as people left to settle in neighborhoods further from the city center. New construction then focused on three and four story walk up apartment buildings. In the 1920s and 30s, many buildings were remodeled, sometimes taking on new, more modern architectural styles, such as the Art Deco style. In the 1960s, residents of the area were alarmed by newer construction allowing for greater density. Neighborhood conservation associations banded together to preserve the architectural character of the area, becoming one of the earliest urban renewal conservation districts. The subject property is a religious retreat center ranging from one to seven stories with exterior brick cladding constructed in 1967, which is well outside the period of historic development of the Mid-North District. The property includes a parking lot along Fullerton and an ornamental lawn along Cleveland. Records indicate that it was designed by architect Charles Pope. Criteria two, the subject property exhibits the general historic and architectural characteristics associated with the district. As previously noted, the Bindorth district contains buildings which exhibit the Italianate Queen Anne and Romanesque revival styles which utilize natural materials with highly ornamental treatments and textures. The overall scales of the building within the district are generally single family homes and small to medium sized apartment buildings, two to five stories in height. Common architectural characteristics include bracketed cornices, double hung windows, ornamental metalwork and or woodwork, stone accents, and raised front stoops. 
The subject property is a religious retreat center, as I mentioned, ranging in height from one to seven stories, uh, constructed in 1967. Uh, here are some photos to just kind of orient you a little bit to the uh, overall character of the building. I think we have another slide with even more photos. Let's go to that one. Uh, the building incorporates red brick in combination with long, narrow vertical piers, metal spandrels, projecting rectangular eaves, geometric brick patterns, and other contemporary surface treatments. While the building does not lack architectural character, it is representative of a later era and does not convey the historic character of the Mid-North District. Criteria three notes that the subject property respects the general site characteristics associated with the district. Uh, the Seneca complex has a, a very irregular footprint and is substantially set back from most of the adjacent streets. Primary access is provided from curb cuts along Fullerton and a private access drive extending from a portion of Cambridge, extending south from Fullerton. It is comprised of six and seven story structures containing sleeping quarters and conference facilities flanking a single story lobby, chapel, and conference room structure. All structures are connected below grade by a basement housing the mechanical system, a dining room, kitchen, and other support spaces. Many historic buildings in the district are located on rectangular lots with small front yards and narrow side yards. In many cases, buildings have been constructed from lot line to lot line. The district also contains a number of courtyard buildings with interior landscape spaces and light courts. The Seneca complex is substantially different in its site characteristics, both in setbacks, height, and massing. Criteria four notes that the subject property exhibits the general size, shape, and scale associated with the district. Uh, historic buildings in the district range from one and a half to five stories in height. At a maximum height of seven stories, the Seneca building is substantially different in size and scale. Number five is that the materials of the subject property are compatible with the district in general character, color, and texture. Uh, the red brick cladding is consistent with historic materials found within the district, although it has been used as a decorative surface rather than a load-bearing material. The building incorporates vertical bands of windows divided by metal spandrels, which is also not characteristic of historic materials. Criteria six uh, notes that if the subject property has been altered in a manner which is contrary to these criteria, such changes could be easily reversed or removed. Uh, synthetic siding, dormers, and porch enclosures shall be deemed easily reversed or removed. Uh, this really isn't particularly applicable because it's not clear that this has changed at all from its uh, initial construction uh, in 1967. Additionally, a prerequisite for demolition is that the demolition of non-contributing buildings, structures, or improvements within a landmark district may be allowed uh, if the building, structure, or improvement proposed for demolition is non-contributing to the character of the district and its removal will not have an adverse effect on the significant historical or architectural features of the district. Uh, the historic development of the Vindorf district occurred from the post-fire years through the 1940s uh, the district is representative of a typical Chicago residential neighborhood at the end of the 19th century. The range of architectural styles contained within the district are typically characterized uh, by features such as raised or prominent entries, bays, cornices, and parapets, and sloped roof forms, often with period detailing, as well as skilled use of materials and craftsmanship. Typical building types seen within the district are small Chicago cottages, row houses, and larger multifamily residential buildings, churches, etc. cetera. Uh, given the above analysis and criteria, staff recommends to the commission that they find the subject building non-contributing to the Mid-North District and recommend to city council approval of the proposed demolition. Uh, these are our four recommendations and I'll just read through them very quickly. Uh, one, find that the period of historic development of the Mid-North District from the Great Fire of 1871 to 1941. Two, find that the masonry building located at 513 West Fullerton, a religious complex constructed in 1967 with varying heights from one to seven stories was built well after the period of historic development of the Mid-North District and is therefore non-contributing to the character of the Mid-North District. Three, find that the demolition of the building 
located 513 West Fullerton will not have an adverse effect on any significant historical or architectural features of the landmark district. And number four, recommend a city council approval of the proposed demolition of the building in accordance with the relevant sections of the municipal code entitled permits for demolition of landmarks, city council approval required. That concludes my presentation. If anyone has questions for me, uh, I know that the development team and their attorney are also uh, at the meeting if you uh, have questions for them. Thank you, Larry. Does the commission have any questions of Larry at this time? Commissioner Hughes. Oof. Um, okay, so I completely understand. Um, I completely understand the point of view here. My question is, I think it's very clear that it's not contributing to the historic district, but do we completely disregard the historic significance the property has on its own in a decision like this? Uh, so not, not necessarily, that was something that we looked into. Uh, one issue with that is that this is a, a religious uh, building, so it would need owner consent in order to be considered for individual designation. And I, I think the, the understanding is that's unlikely to happen given that the, the owners are, are seeking to, to demolish it. Uh, can Mr. Hughes that answer your question? It does. Okay. Any other questions for Larry at this time? Um, if not, oh, Commissioner Tolliver, please. Commissioner, you're on mute. Commissioner Tolliver, you're on mute. There you go. Thank you. Uh, I don't have any questions for Larry, but I have some comments that affirms the staff decision. I've okay. stayed in that building many times uh, for parish retreats. Our, our parish would have annual leadership retreats there over the years, and we really enjoyed the hospitality. Uh, it was inhabited by nuns who were very aged. So I'm sure at this point, uh, there are even fewer, if any, there. Uh, the facility absolutely does not conform on the exterior to the surrounding area. We have an Episcopal church directly across the street, Ch Church of Our Savior, which I'm sure the saw staff saw, and it architecturally conforms to the neighborhood. They, the parking was very limited, uh, so that even in hosting retreats, uh, if you didn't get there early, you didn't get a parking spot, and then there virtually nowhere to park on Fullerton. You'd have to go all the way up to Halstead or somewhere. So it's not a functional space as constructed for anyone else who would use it for any other purpose. The rooms were very simple and would today only lend themselves to something like an SRO, uh, if that. Uh, and the baths were communally shared in the hallway. So even the interior, it is not a functional space if it were to remain. I don't know who would be attracted to want to own it. Thank you, Commissioner Tolliver. Um, and we do have, just to note, um, we do have the uh, owner's representative as well as the alderman uh, speaking as well. Uh, Commissioner Cox, please. Um, thank you. I just had a question about uh, the underlying zoning uh and whether um the if uh, if uh demolition is permitted um what uh what can happen in its place i'm assuming it's not going to stay a cleared site that it will end up being redeveloped and i just want to make sure i understand uh what that uh what's going to be allowed uh as a result of this uh, being demolished, if it's granted? You know, I would gladly uh, defer to the development team on that. I believe it's a, it's an RM5 currently, but I think their plans are, are pretty specific at this point. So I will we'll maybe uh, okay. hear from them on that yeah. issue. When, we, when 
we can ask that question when they make their statement. Uh, so the RM, RM5 zoning stays in place after the demolition um, and whatever, if, if it were to be, if it were to be other than things permitted in RM5, they would come back to the plan commission for whatever rezoning. I just, you know, I, th I mean, I think the, the body, the, the commission has to know that there are some consequences to the demolition. And we wanna make sure while we're here just to evaluate the demolition uh, that we, um, we do that with our eyes wide open. I believe there is no plan currently to rezone that area, but I will definitely defer to the development team. Yep. Thank so you. We'll, uh, and I think Commissioner Cox was, was getting at if there is a change and, and I think the owner's representative will uh, be able to answer that question as well as we move forward. Uh, Commissioner Geary. Um, thank you, Chairman. Uh, it was a similar or, or related question. Are there any submitted or proposed plans? So, you know, what, what would be the future of this site? Was there anything submitted? There were there was some information submitted. At, uh, we are waiting on a more complete submittal, but uh, as I understand the proposal, it is to to subdivide the area into several different lots and um, to develop those individually. Um, that's all I can really say at this point. We I do want to mention that all new construction on on this land would obviously need to go to the permit review committee, and we have a fairly um, a fairly uh, uh, comprehensive list of information we would need in order to confirm that any new development is compatible with the with the historic character of that district. With that in mind, uh, and having no other commissioners uh, uh, having questions for Larry, I think it's uh, an appropriate time now to ask the owner's representative, uh, Mr. Acosta. Uh, if you'd like to make a statement, please. Yes, Mr. Chairman, pleasure to be here. Chairman and Commissioners, Rolando Acosta. I am the uh, attorney for the developer and the owner's representative in this matter. I have with me uh, Robert Bono, who is a representative of the developer. And I have Mr. Dan Wheeler from Wheeler Kearns, who is the architect uh, for the new development, but also has been working on the, uh, the demolition portion. So I'd like to start by saying that today's question is rather a narrow question, I think as Commissioner Hughes has noted, uh, perhaps with some, some chagrin, but it's whether or not the current building is a contributing uh, factor to the historic district. And I think uh, Mr. Schur has made a great presentation as to why it is not, and we concur with his presentation. I think it also was augmented by Commissioner Tolliver, who's intimately apparently familiar with the structure and both its lack of functionality in today's world um, and the, the lack of ability uh, to repurpose the current building as well as its lack of consistency with the district. Uh, I would like to also address uh, Commissioner Cox and to some extent Commissioner Geary's and Commissioner Hughes's questions about the future. There is a plan to redevelopment for this property. Uh, we have been discussing that redevelopment with the communities uh, community members and specifically the Mid North Association, as you heard from Mr. Moore earlier during the public comment, they are supportive of the demolition and they are supportive of the future development. Uh, and we, we need to iron out exactly how we will cement our commitments to the community, uh, but we have made those commitments and we intend to keep it. The, re the future plans, just to preview it for you, is to build uh, to divide the property along its Fullerton frontage, along its Cleveland frontage, and along its east-west Cambridge frontage into individual lots that would be developed with single family homes or at most two flats uh, with respect to the properties on Fullerton and Cambridge. Those developments or those individual homes would have to come before this commission for approval, would obviously also have to conform to the existing zoning. On the portion of the property that fronts what is an extension of North-South Cambridge. Uh, there is a proposed multi-unit building containing nine units that we have submitted preliminary plans for the review of that to staff. 
but today's decision is a precursor because none of that can happen unless of course the existing building can be demolished. We are, we've stated to the committee, community, we have stated to the Mid-North Association, I've stated to Mr. Moore, uh, and we have stated to the Alderman that we are committed to our plan. We believe we have a general community support for our plan, both demolition and future plans. Uh, and we look forward to bringing those before the commission in the city. I'd also like to address the comments made by the neighbors uh, in the building immediately to our north with respect to demolition and the aspen trees that are located in the parking lot adjacent to their property on the west. Uh, we're very familiar with the conditions surrounding this site. Mr. Bono can speak at length about the plans for demolition, but we are familiar with the issues related to the Victorian house to our north and their foundations uh, adjacent to the property on the Seneca property is a retaining wall that is intended to be kept. Uh, there's also a foundation for the structure there that is intended to be kept, which would help support uh, the uh, Victorian Houses Foundation or Victorian Landmark Buildings Foundation. Uh, and obviously we would be subject to all of the city regulations with respect to uh, protecting adjacent buildings. With the permission of neighbors, we'd be happy to come in, survey, photograph, uh, and make sure that we document existing conditions so that we can protect those uh, buildings and have evidence of any damage. Uh, with respect to the aspen trees, we've looked into protecting them and preserving them during demolition uh, and believe we can do so. So we don't expect those trees to come down as part of the demolition of this building if such demolition were permitted. Uh, I think we've addressed all of the community related issues. We have a plan moving forward with respect to the future development and you, the commission has regulatory oversight over those plans, as well as the city zoning uh, department and building department. With that, we are, I am here, Mr. Bono is here and Mr. Wheeler is here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Acosta. Uh, does the commission have any questions for Mr. Acosta or the development team or the architect? at this time. Um, I, I do want to re uh, or just clarify, uh, Mr. Acosta, so that um, uh, to answer Commissioner Cox's and Commissioner Geary's question, at this time, there's not in a, uh, an intent for a PD or a zoning change. Is that correct? A a absolutely. No, there is not. Actually, the proposed development is significantly less dense than what would be allowed on the property which is a reason why the neighbors are so supportive, we'd essentially be returning this property to something that does conform to the district, which is single family home for the okay. most part. Thank you. Uh, any commissioners have any further questions? Okay. Um, Alderman Smith, uh, you are here and uh, would you like to make an, a, a, a statement? Yes, I would. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Thank you to the commission. As you, as you all know, historic preservation is a passionate, uh, a passionate and very well loved part of our ward. We think we have the most historic districts of any place in Chicago. And this site is very important because unlike other situations, this site is literally in the heart of the Mid North District. Had the Senecal not been built in 1967, I'm sure it would still be a lot of old historic structures that were probably of the same time period as everything around it. Uh, virtually every building in the Mid-North District is in the Landmark District, but both in and of itself orange rated of high quality. So while I certainly cannot dispute that this is an outdated and not consistent building with our community. I, I want to curb the enthusiasm a little bit of our friends who are attempting, who are planning to redevelop it because our community is very concerned and is very grateful for the support of the Landmark Commission, the Permit Review Commission and DPD in the future. One, uh, one concern that we have that I wanna share is that because the plan is to divide this into numerous lots, we would like to work 
with DPD and landmarks to make sure that we are not setting our community up for nine separate future little landmark battles under individual homes. We'd rather, we are attempting to work with the developer on a set of protocols that are legally enforceable about setbacks, height, and bulk. One of the key criteria of the Mid-North Historic District, if you actually read the beautiful report that was written at the time Mid-North was designated, talked about the proportions of the, um, the proportions of the buildings. And the proportions of those buildings, some of which are large, are large, actually pretty large, are very different than the proportions of single family homes today. And so we're very concerned that uh, what comes on this site is related to the proportions of the building in our landmark district. Uh, maybe we wouldn't have this concern if this was on the edge of the district or if it was you know, in some other circumstance, but as this is exactly on the district, on Fullerton Parkway, both sides of which are in the landmark district, and down Cleveland Street, one of the most important landmark streets in the city for residential construction, that we will be having a very, very watchful eye uh, with these developers and, and, and look forward to the Landmark Commission's support in making sure that the new development is cons consistent, in some, consistent with this Landmark District. And we're looking forward to continue to work on this with Mr. Rolando and his clients. But I just wanted to give you that, give you the, and, and uh, Mr. Rolando, uh, Rolando's uh, Acosta's clients have been proactive in reaching out to the neighborhood group, but we are not there yet. And I look forward to hopefully, hopefully getting there. So, um, so thank you very much for allowing me to give you this a uh, little bit more detail. Thank you, Alderman Smith. Does the commission have any questions for Alderman Smith this time? or the development team, or the owner's representative, or the architect. Um, uh, Commissioner Geary. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, it's not a question, it's just a, <laughs> a collective reflection um, and just an expression of disappointment um, about you know, the, the little creativity um, that we have in preserving structures of this nature. Um, I know the, the ordinance doesn't really get into protect this kind of structures, which are really interesting and, and unique. We don't build religious centers like this anymore. Let's just be honest uh, and, and clear about that. So it's just um, you know a concern that I have um, around our, our ordinance in general that you know we protect uh, buildings from certain time frame, um, and there's contributions that are um, that are important to recognize, especially in the historic fabric, but also more modern language um, that legacy buildings and, and places like this one can offer. So um, I just wanted to offer that reflection. Um, obviously, we understand the limitations of our ordinance in protecting places and buildings. But I, I just want to, uh, you know, we keep seeing cases similar to this one where the attempt to um, for adaptive reuse is not given an opportunity, or at least it's not presented in a way that it's part of the storytelling and 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 the case building of, of decision making process like this. So um, just wanted to make that that statement. Um, we all love our old buildings, um, you know. Uh, beginning of the century, I think the 60s also deserves that <laughs> care and love and, uh, and acknowledgement. So I just wanted to reflect that, um, reflect on that um, um, out loud. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Gary. Commissioner Jakovic. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I just had a more, of a, I guess, kind of a reflection um, and um, question about, you know, in, regarding uh, landmarking of buildings for religious institutions, which um, it's, we have to have, it's, my understanding is the ordinance says that we have to have consent from the, the owner of the property in it, in it, uh, to, to, to um, recommend a, a landmark designation. And I'm just wondering, it, it, um, I could see this being an issue throughout the, throughout, you know, 
other projects, other other buildings that are in our city. I'm just wondering if that's is how is that something that could ever be reconsidered in the in the ordinance? Um, and it's just a general question to the Thank staff, you. I suppose. Thank you. Um, uh, Deanna, do you want to, uh, uh, can you address Commissioner Jekowitz's uh, question or concern about um, the fact Mr. that Chairman, this is This a, is Deanna yeah. Cavallo. Um, so um, as uh, Commissioner stated, uh, current landmarks ordinance does include a section, uh, it's section 2, 126, 60, um, that does indicate that um, for, for a building that's owned by a religious organization and is used for conduct of religious ceremonies, um, we cannot initiate and proceed with designation without the owner consent. Um, we are aware that there was a, an ordinance introduced by an alderman um, to um, remove this section from the ordinance, but that has not been taken up by the city council committee yet that I'm aware of. Um, so whether that is uh, possible or whether that is going to happen, I, I, cannot, um, I cannot speak to. Um, I know that there are a lot of legal concerns as well that would need to be addressed, um, but it is, it is currently in the ordinance, so this is really what we need to abide by at this time. Thank you, Deanna. Does that answer your question? Yep. Sure? Yep. Okay. So uh, it, have, it would have to go to city council. It would have to be taken up at city council. Yeah. Yes, okay. that is correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hughes. Um, is, is that coming up on the city council's agenda? It has not yet, and I really don't know <laughs> the, the future of it, um, but certainly if there are updates, we'd be happy to update the commission on that. Okay, um, I'm asking because I think it, it does, that something important like that does impact uh, cases like this one. I also wanna echo Commissioner Aguirre's comments on just like, <laughs> Uh, I, th this is, this is a significant structure by itself. And yes, it does not abide by the historic district that's been established, but it is significant standing alone. Um, and, you know, owners of these properties are not historians or, <laughs> or they're not, you know, architects or, you know, commission, you know, whatever. And so I don't, I don't expect um, owners to have um, the property's best interest at heart and whether or not it should be preserved. Um, that shouldn't fall, that burden shouldn't fall on them. Um, but I think it's our collective responsibility to save structures like this. Um, and I did see a lot of concerns in the letters that were from this community about um, the impact that the new construction is going to have on their properties. and. Um, you know, especially during the demolition and also like losing the diversity of structures in this area. You know, this district, it's, it's, I loved it. And thank you again, um, Alderman, for taking me on that beautiful tour when I was first, when I first became a commissioner. Um, but diversity in structures and buildings um, is something that's very unique and contributes to cultures of places. And I think mm -hmm. This is certainly one of them. Um, and I also agree with Commissioner Gary on the time frame. Uh, it, it is significant, period. Um, and I know that there's limited uses that it can be in the future, but I'm sure we can find a way. We we have some very creative brains out here. So that's those are my comments. I'm I'm equally disappointed as well. Thank you, Commissioner Hughes. Uh, Commissioner Tolliver. You're again, you're on mute. Just, All right, there, there, we go. Go. there we go. We have these discussions, but obviously there are other forms which are more proper for them. And in those forms, rather than just have a point of view 
from the professional architect, you need the point of view of the people who are saying, we don't want to do this. Uh, and I'm very sensitive to the religious order uh, issue because I know about it. Uh, these nuns are dying. Their religious orders need money to care for them. Uh, and so in many instances, they're liquidating properties which they can no longer use uh, to create, uh, create in perpetuity uh, funds to take care of their aging members. Uh, so to say that they are not insensitive to preserving the building, I think they'd be offended. Uh, so it's important to hear everybody's story and not just our professional story that doesn't take in the human story of the people who are having to make these painful decisions to liquidate properties that they obviously love. And that, that's all I'd like to say. Too often we get into these kinds of discussions in this meeting. Um, and I don't know if this is the appropriate form to prolong meetings to do this. Thank you, Commissioner Tolliver. Commissioner Ponce. Yes, thank you. Um, I would also like to agree with Commissioner Hughes and Commissioner Aguirre in their comments. Um, and, and just wondering where the where the creativity of the proposed would be. And I also understand where Commissioner Tolliver is coming from of, you know, if it does not function. Um, then obviously something has to be done, right? But uh, for it, it is an important issue to look at um, future religious structures and being creative on how to preserve them and how to use the adaptive reuse and, and understanding what is the long-term impact you know, if this whole development is coming down, what is a long-term impact of the, of the future development? You know, what does it do for the people living there, you know, in the long-term? So mm -hmm. I too will be um, curious to see how it develops in the future and how we can be more creative in, re in reusing our structures because we can, rather than just starting from, scratch. Um, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ponce. Um, Alderman Smith, you... you. I, I, I just want to say, I, I appreciate everything that the commission is saying. And I guess you hear some of these. But I will say that, you know, we've had stories go both ways in our ward and are very sensitive to the issues. Um, you know, we, we just when the Second Church of Christ Science wanted to keep their building but couldn't afford it, we put together a proposal. It's not in the landmark district. So there was more flexibility and they're keeping their space and most of their church. That goes on all over the city, as you know, where you kind of reach a compromise where you preserve the facade because as everyone knows, these churches are not even really not necessarily uh, work with how people worship today. And um, the nuns of this community are very well loved in Lincoln Park. And uh, Mr. Tolliver is correct. The nuns have to support themselves. And it is true, just so I can put a little context on it, on every landmarking decision that you make, these questions come up, not just religious institutions. Right, And people are always concerned that they want to sell their property for the most that they can. And so, you know, we made the decision decades ago that we were going to landmark these areas because the community decided that this is what they wanted to do. And that's why we generally fight to keep them. Now, I will say that with regard to mid-century, thank goodness that's being recognized. So, so for example, in Old Town, which is another gigantic historic district, as you know, there was an awful lot of mid set, a really wonderful mid century development done in Old Town before it was landmarked. And, landmark, and the Old Town Triangle has a proposal in front of this commission 
that staff is reviewing to adopt a means to bring those mid-century buildings, which are by, you know, a bunch of really great architects into the district somehow. So we would love your support in, in making that happen so that we can recognize the arts and crafts and the, and the uh, mid-century architecture uh, in the triangle, even though it's not in the period. But this is a different situation. It really is kind of a singular, singular situation. So I really appreciate what you all are saying. And sometimes this stuff happens and we try very hard to see if there's an alternative and in this case, the sisters didn't have them. And I, yeah, they are part of our community. I know many of them. Many of our neighbors know them. And uh, I, I've been in that retreat house myself. And it, it, is, it is more an unfortunate circumstance of how you know, the church has evolved. So I just wanted to say thank you, give you a little context of how supportive we are to what you're doing with regard to mid-century architecture. Thank you, thank you, Alderman Smith. Um, I, I don't see any other hands up, but I did want to mention also, you know, uh, personally that I'm a child of mid-century architecture. Uh, grew up with it, you know. As you know, many of you know that my dad was a protege of Mies van der Rohe, and um, you know, I, I look at this building and I'm totally amazed by it. But I also see the social value that you know. Um, uh, that uh, Commissioner Tauber has, has indicated and, and Alderman Smith as well, and the difficulties of the situation. Um, I typically wouldn't, you know, I, I would be a little bit more concerned, except for one thing. The one thing that I will note here is that this team actually of this, of the architecture firms of Wheeler Kearns and, you know, and the owner's representative, Rolando Acosta, who stands up for what he believes in and will do what he says he's gonna do. I actually trust them to do the right thing. And, and I guess, you know, I'm putting my faith in them in terms of what I think that they're going to do in terms of uh, kind of down, uh, decreasing the, the density of this area. Um, and I think that their architecture, quite frankly, is going to be just as spectacular. Um, I would like to say though, if it's possible to salvage some of that brick, it is beautiful um, as it comes down. It, that would be fantastic. So uh, with that, uh, Commissioner Cox. Uh, yes, I, I mean, I, uh, I, I mean, I appreciate the conversation and the, that's going on. And, um, you know, I, I you know, the, 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 the professional staff uh, has made a recommendation and I um, fully expect to support it. Uh, I am um, um, probably more concerned about the what comes next, uh, and um, you know, uh, before there was uh, a, re a religious complex there, there was a, a history of of houses there. Uh, they had a particular lot size. Uh, they had um, a relationship to each other, uh, and um, I would hope that that the team that's assembled will be looking at the history before this current history and let that be one's guide. Uh, because the, you, can, you can do single family houses and you can do them and they will be just as out of context with the historic district because of their size or because of some character. So, you know, the planning department is willing and able uh, and in partnership with the alderman to make sure that what is built in its place truly honors the history of that site, which goes beyond the current building. And I would add that the current building, there are also ways that the, the memory of that um, religious site could also um, inform the next steps. Um, these beautiful courtyard spaces, these green spaces, uh, that uh, are a part of the current complex. So I just hope that the, the team is willing to honor the history, the real history of the site pre-church and include the memory of the church as you move forward so that we don't get some cookie cutter subdivide the site and make you know bloated mansions. 
on it. So, uh, so we will work, the, the planning staff will work with you to make sure uh, that, you know, um, that we can channel all these concerns that have been heard about how do you create a site that is multiple histories. Um, and, and that might be an honor to the church, even if uh, this commission supports uh, its demolition. So uh, it's mostly future tense, what I'm talking about. Uh, I, I, we have the recommendation uh, in, front, in front of us, but uh, it's really important, uh, this question about, um, well, we're not asking special zoning because we're gonna put single family houses there. Well, there are ways to put a single family house there that honor the scale and character of that community. And that's where you start. Uh, and I hope that's where the development team um, is intending to go. Thank you, Commissioner Cox. Commissioner Geary. Thank you, Chairman. Just one quick question, just to reiterate, the, the, whatever the redevelopment proposal um, shapes into, it has to come to Permit Review Committee, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, with that wonderful discussion, um, I would like to request a motion to accept the staff recommendation on the permit application for demolition of 513 West Fullerton Avenue. Is there a motion? So moved. Commissioner Tolliver, is there a second? Second by Commissioner Cox. Okay, I'm gonna do the roll call. Commissioner Hughes. Present. Commissioner Osmond. I'm sorry. Uh, raise your hand if you say yes. I'm not seeing that. <laughs> Commissioner Osmond, can you? Okay. Yep. Okay. So that's yes. Um, Commissioner Jekowitz. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Ponce. Yes. Um, Commissioner Aguirre. Uh, painfully on this one, I'm going to say no. Okay. Um, Commissioner Cox. Uh, yes. And I am voting yes as well. Let the record show that um, there, uh, the motion carries. There is one who voted present and one no on this as well. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's get to the Permit Review Committee report, reports. Um, this is the report on the project, uh, <coughs> excuse me, on the projects reviewed at the May 6th, 2021 Permit Review Committee meeting. And I'd like to call in Commissioner Aguirre for the, uh, for the notes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the Permit Review Committee reviewed six projects um, at its May 6th, 2021 meeting. Um, all six projects were approved with conditions. Uh, the report summarizing the scope of the proposed projects and the committee's decision was included in your packets. Uh, this report is for your information and for the record. Thank you, Commissioner Gary. And Larry, can you give us a report? Uh, sure. Uh, for the month of May, staff reviewed 170 permit applications. Three of these applications relate to projects reviewed by the Permit Review Committee. A total of 189 reviews were performed by staff and the average number of days to issue the approval or corrections were three days. Uh, staff also reviewed sign, uh, I'm sorry, four sign applications during the uh, month of May. Thank you, Larry. Okay, uh, the last thing we have today is the announcements on the citywide Adopt-A-Landmark Fund. Uh, the 2021 Adopt-A-Landmark application period officially opened last Thursday, May 27th, 2021. As you may recall at, it, at our uh, May 6th, 2021 meeting, the commission approved the new 2021 priority for funding adoptive landmark projects. And it is a neighborhood, um, and it is neighborhood anchor and neighborhood commercial landmark buildings. This year's program will devote $6 million in total funding for selected projects. A pre-submission meeting will be held at 1 p.m. 
on Wednesday, June 16th via Zoom and final applications will be due by 4 p.m. on Monday, August 16th, 2021. So I encourage you all to uh, get out and, and see what two projects that are available. More details, including pre-submission meetings, uh, registration information, and the application itself may be found on DPD's website at chicago.gov uh, slash AAL. And finally, if there's no further business, I'd like to request a motion to adjourn. Is there a motion? So moved. It's, uh, Commissioner Hughes and a second. Second. Uh, Commissioner Geary. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 <clears throat> okay, we're off to the races. Commissioner Geary, you want to uh, give a statement on when you want to start your PRC meeting? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, um, 10 minutes. Um, Tech, can you confirm 10, 10 minutes is okay for a break? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, 10 minutes would be great. Okay, let's reconvene at 3.35. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.